And I used to play it years ago. Everybody's heard that the history repeats itself, right? Mm -hmm. Now you talk about Rosewood. Mm -hmm. Seven days after Christmas, yeah, 1923. Seven days after Christmas, 1923 was New Year's Day when all the commotion started in Rosewood where they started chasing all the people of color away and doing, you know, what they wanted to do. Now, I said that for a reason. Mm -hmm. Talking about history repeats itself. Now, I said seven days after Christmas, 1923, when the Rosewood Massacre started. Now, history repeats itself. Not 1923, but 2003, seven days before Christmas, the only first people of color to move back into Rosewood was chased out. Seven days before Christmas, which was the 18th of December, 2003. Okay. Okay, now that's what I say. History repeated itself. What happened? I never put it together. Hmm. But I had a whole herd of boar goats in a field near the property line. Oh, a bunch of baby, baby, beautiful baby boar goats. They all laid down and died in the field. I thought that maybe it was something in the grass or in the field that ate, didn't agree with them. So I just chalked it up that that's what it was. But it was a mother and one baby that I moved from that field to the field in front of the house. Now they survived. They didn't die. I brought that mother and her baby to O'Kella when I moved here. Hmm. And in the field where the mother and the baby were, were two, a, a donkey and a mule. They came to O'Kella with me too. See, I have, you know, you heard the saying 40 acres. Mm -hmm. I had 40 acres in Rosewood and a mule. <laughs> <laughs> I did. My mule broke her leg, and I had to put her down while she was at it. But, and, but, now, I said all of that to say what I said, coming to the point. De December the 18th, 2003, I was here in Old Keller, and right in the same room that we in right now, for my grandson's birthday, my daughter's son. His birthday is December the 18th. So I was here in O'Kella. My wife was down on the island, Cedar Key Island, at the schoolhouse for a program for the children, my grandchildren, who went to Cedar Key School. My brick home decided to catch fire and destroy itself completely destroy itself. I had nothing left in this world except the clothes on my back. No, no, no material, nothing left. 
everything I had, even money that I had in the house burned up. Everything. December the 18th, 2003, seven days before Christmas. And why I say history repeats itself, I decided to rebuild my house. Levy County refused to give me a permit to rebuild my house. I'd like to say something about Levy County. When I went into the office, the permit office, to get a permit to rebuild my house, I didn't tell the people who I was. I walked up to the county, and the lady came to the desk. I said, Miss, I'd like to get a permit to repair my house. You can't repair your house. You have to rebuild it. I never told her who I was now, but she knew in Bronson that my house in Rosewood couldn't be repaired. It had to be rebuilt. A light went off in this old dummy's head. How did this woman know that I had to rebuild my house? So I went along with the program. I said, lady, well, since I got to rebuild a house, give me my old blueprints and I'll rebuild it. Oh, you can't use them. They're obsolete. I said, well, give them to me anyway and tell me what the, the new code is, and I'll bring them up to date. Oh, I can't tell you that. You have to go to the library and look it up. I said, well, give me my, per you know, the blueprint, and I'll go to the library. Well, I can't do that now, because they're downstairs and locked up, and they have to come back Friday when I got somebody to go down there to get them. So I left. Friday, instead of going back to the permit office, I went to the commissioner's office in the courthouse. I said, I forget the man's name right off the bat. I said, Mr. Whatever his name is, I said, I have an idea. I'm going over to the permit office to get my blueprints for my house, but I have an idea that they're going to come up with some excuse why they can't give it to me. And the lady told me to come back today because there was nobody to go downstairs and get them out of the files. He said, oh, no, no, no. So he got on the telephone, called a permit. I have Mr. Reynolds here, and he's going to come over to get his permit. I mean, blueprints. Oh, Mr. So-and-so, we can't have nobody to go down and get them, you know. <laughs> Nobody to go get him. He looked at me and I looked at him and said, well, I had an idea they were going to come up with something like that. He said, well, you get somebody and go get him. Well, I was, I was like, you get somebody and go get him. So I went over. They gave him a book, but they didn't give him to me. I had to pay $18. Not to the permit office, but the building inspector. Now, what he had to do with the permit on it, I don't know. But the bill inspector is what I had to make the check out to for my blueprints, $18. So, I looked at the blueprint. My foundation, that before you come up with the bricks and whatnot on my brick home, was 18 inches. And the new code said you have to have a 20 inch foundation now. That would, I say, well, now you got, I'd have to dig into the ground and get the foundation because I had the foundation there and the slab, you know, bricks, concrete slab. All I had to do was come on up with two by fours and build a house. But I said the 20, 18 inches and the 20 inches. They know it was 18 inches. So you know what that would have meant? Tear it down. Not that it mean anything, but... So, I didn't get a permit. I didn't get a permit to build my house. They wouldn't give it to me. Hunting season was coming on. And I lived on 40 acres surrounded by a paper company. 
in Roseland. Well, the paper company sold, it was international when I bought it. They sold it to Southwest. Southwest sold it to Georgia Pacific. And the paper company to the paper company. Eventually, they sold it to a bunch of rich white people down in Port Ritchie, Florida, who made a hunting club called the Big Buck Hunting Club. Now, there always was a hunting club out there, McIntyre. Because they would come out and shoot a deer or something like that. And say, come on, runners, we're going to have a deer roast. Come on down and have, you know, dinner with us. For years, 30 years, they had to knock it down. But when the big, rich white folks from Port Ritchie bought the property, they put fences around everything called the Big Buck Hunting Club. Now, I'm going to go back a little bit, back on my story. Okay. Okay. A couple of fellas came out and wanted to hunt from town. Friends of ours. So that's a show. I don't, I, I don't hunt. Because it used to be a big buck would come in my backyard every evening about 5 o'clock. And he'd bring a buck by four or five does with it. He would eat while they played. They would, I see him back there clapping the hands together. And I saw him out there and he had a rack on his head. I said, well, eight point book. I got my gun. I said, ooh. I put it right dead on him. He raised that head up and looked at me and shook it. I said, you too pretty to shoot. I took my gun back and put it down. <laughs> and that was the biggest mistake I ever made. Hmm. He wasn't afraid of humans after that because he see me out there. He knew I wasn't going to hurt him. So he didn't pay me no to But the big white hunters from Port Ritchie shot him up at what you call Moody Grave. It was up next road up the road from me. Hmm. I happened to see him going down to the, the way station. I said, where did you get that? Day? Oh, I, you wouldn't know something about Moody Ray. I said, I bet you he stood there and let you shoot him. He said, how did you know? And I looked at him. He wasn't an eight-point boy. He had nine points. He had a beautiful rack on his head. It hurt me. I said, I, if I'd have shot over his head, that would have made him scared and run. Therefore, he would have known to run. But I, I didn't do that. But I'm saying that for I'm staying my story with the Big Buck Hunting Club. Well, the two fellas came out to hunt on my property. They shot a couple of deer, you know, two deer, one apiece. The Big Buck Hunting Club people went to town and told the fellas that came out to my property they couldn't hunt. They going to tell them what they can do on my property. This is my property, you know, in Rosewood. I said, where did they get off telling people they can't come to on my property? But let me tell you, it was 600 acres, 600 and some acres, surrounding my little 40. They used to belong to the paper company. Well, all these rich folks from Port Ricky bought all 600 acres for the paper company, except my 40. So, I forget his name. I, I, got, a, I got it on a piece of paper in my file at home. But he came, he said, would you like to sell your property to the big boss? I said, no, my property is not for sale. I'm not selling. So, that's when my problem started. My animals laid down, going back to what I said before, all my borough goats in the field laid down and died. <clears throat> then, while my wife was in Cedar Key and I was here in Oak Hill, my brick home decided to destroy itself. The fire marshal said, cause a fire unknown. <laughs> now, 
I'm not no fire marshal, but I look at Perry Mason and all the people, and they can find a matchstick in there, and, and, and they say, well, this fire started from such and such a thing. Fire unknown. Now. Let me, let me chime in here a minute. <clears throat> and speaking about the fire, we had, what was it, six or seven fire companies that come to this fire mm. with no water. Oh, yeah, we didn't get to the water part. They came with no water pumps. I had a swimming pool in my backyard full of water. Plus, I had a little pond not far from the house, mm -hmm. right, with fish in it, because I used fish in it, and people come fish. They came with no water on the fire truck, plus the pumps they brought with them didn't work. They couldn't pump water from a pool, not a pond. So my house was completely destroyed. I'm not joking. If I'd known I was going to do it, I would have brought some, because I usually carry it with me. Those coins. I know, I usually carry it with me each and every, I got pictures to show you what my house looked like. And what it looked like December the 19th, 2003. Nothing. And how wrong could I have been? And I told my wife, bricks don't burn. <laughs> but they do. They, the br bricks didn't the brick, burn. Didn't the bricks didn't burn. But the fire was so hot, the mortar between the bricks crumbled the bricks, but it fell in. Wow. And everything was destroyed. It was the front turn strips, the roof, and everything. Well, if I, I, I had pictures I, I carried with me, and I just, I was well, with my checkbook, and I had doing bills, so I, I left it on the desk at home. I carried with me each and every day. I was telling the lady about yesterday, yesterday when I went to get my truck to all change, I was telling her about Rosewood. I don't know why I was talking about it, <laughs> but I, you know, it's, it's I forget what the conversation, but it came up rosy. Mm -hmm. But I made a big mistake when I said bricks don't burn. I had absolutely nothing. No material, nothing. I'm not telling you. You know, but, but the people on the island were very nice. The school, they took up a collection for oh, us, yeah. all the churches down in that area. Oh, oh. The people were really nice. Oh, well, the, the local people, yeah. we had been there. And they knew us. Very they nice. knew us. You know, all of, when we first moved there, they were kind of reluctant against us. Because here we had colored people moving back in the Rosewood. Everything was white. We were the only people of color anywhere. Yeah. So they... They didn't resent it, but they, they accepted us. Yeah. They eventually, as the years went by, they would come to me. I had a tractor and farming equipment where I farm and whatnot on my 40 acres. You know, I had to do something. Oh, yeah. So they would come and say, Well, Mr. Reynolds, we'd like you to plow this or do this. So they got to know, know us, you know. And my wife was affiliated down to the school, and my grandchildren went to see the key school. And on top of it, my granddaughter represented the county, Levy County, at the governor's mansion <laughs> from Cedar Key. See, uh, so we were known. Everybody knew the Reynolds because we were the only ones that, and we got along with the local people until the big buck rich people came in and put their big buck hunting club there. Now, the kicker was, after they went to town told the people they couldn't hunt on my property, the big buck people put a gate across my road. And the road led to nowhere but to my home. This is before the fire. This is before the fire. So now, if you wanted to come and visit me, you couldn't get into my house because there's a gate across the road. You know, that's what they did. And I went to the county and said, How could they do this? How could they do yeah. it? They said, they Well, gave us a you key. know what the county told they me? They gave us a key. They, they, you know what the county told me? They have a right to put a gate there to protect their property. 
their property was nothing but woods on this side, woods on this side. The only resident or any cultivation of anything was my property. My f fields were cultivated, my home, and everything. But the rest around me, all wood. No houses, no nothing but woods. They had a right to protect their property. Put a gate across my field. So they said, they gave me a key. And the county said, well, they gave you a key. I said, well, suppose you want to come visit me. Do you have a key to open it? He didn't answer me. I say, well, I, in other words, people can't come. I, I'm just isolated. That's Levy County. I'm talking about Levy County. <laughs> Levy County hasn't changed from 1923 to 2003. I don't know about now, but 2003, Levy County was the same as it was in 1923. As far as I was concerned. And I don't say it lightly. I don't say this lightly. But black people are afraid of white people that live in Levy County. I'm not joking. They are afraid of white people. Black people. I'm not joking. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to say this. People used to, you know, since we lived out there in Rosa, mm -hmm. black people would come visit us, but dust dog, they had to get out of it. I never knew why. <laughs> <laughs> but they didn't want to let night catch them in Rosewood because they were afraid of white people. I'm not joking. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to say this. It was a prominent black person. It was a prominent black person. When I say prominent, that he did something is in my mind and I'll never forget it. I've heard these things, but I never saw it until he did it. This prominent person said, Reynolds, I know you have a fireplace, and I know where we can get some wood for your fireplace. I said, okay. So he said, you got you have a chainsaw, don't you? I said, yes. So he says, okay, well, get your chainsaw and come with me. So I got my chainsaw, and he took me over to this white man's property. And let me tell you, this prominent black person was the boss of the white person when we were cutting the tree. He was the boss of this white person. So I was down there cutting the wood. And he said, I ain't going to tell you the man's name, but he said, so-and-so, you know that boy doing a good job. You ought to get down there with him and do it too. He said, <laughs> I had never in my life saw, uh, I've heard of shuffling your feet and <laughs> doing that kind of stuff, but I saw it, I looked, I said, how can this man be a prominent person in the community and, and the white man's boss and do that? But he did it. And I, it, 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 it it's a shame to talk about the dead. But this person passed not not too long ago. Mm -hmm. He's not he's out here. But here is, that was a problem. That's what the black people in Levy County are. They are free. Mm -hmm. Right? I used to say when you cross from Marion County, in the Levy County years ago. You crossed from 1900 into 1800. <laughs> That's the way I looked at Mary. You know, I'm a native Floridian. Hmm. My family, my, I, I put it this way, my mother, I want to talk about my mother's side. My mother 
was born in Florida, Columbia County. My grandmother was born in Florida, in Columbia County. What happened is my grandmother witnessed a lynching in Columbia County. Columbia County had a, a record. I will tell you, I don't know if you ever heard of Columbia County, mm -hmm. but they had a record of misusing black people. These, I, I, I don't like to use the word, but they, they said colored fry on Saturday night. They didn't use color, they used the N-word mm -hmm. on Friday night. Mm -hmm. And then they drag them behind the pulp with trucks mm -hmm. after they fry them. Well, my grandmother witnessed a lynching in 1900, turn of the century. And my grandfather says, time to move. So he left Columbia County and moved into Marion County. A lot of people don't know Marion County was a progressive county for black people. We were colored at the time, for colored people. I've been, oh, since we talking about it, I'm, I'm going to tell you, I've been four or five different things in my <laughs> lifetime. I, I've been a Negro. I've been... Black, I, and it's one thing I'm definitely, and it was truthfully, but of course they use it derogatory. I'm colored. I am still colored. Now I'll always be colored, but now this Afro American that they got me being now, there's <laughs> nobody in my family I can trace back to Africa. But somewhere along the line, somebody way back somewhere or another came from Africa. Because I'm brown skin, you know. So brown, uh, of course, they didn't have to come from Africa. They could have come from one of them Hawaiian Islands, or Tahiti or somewhere, because they brown skin too. Mm -hmm. But uh, I say that. But going back, my grandmother moved to Marion County because mm -hmm. of an aggressive county as far as colored people are concerned. A lot of people don't know, and you probably don't know it, but Marion County, <laughs> when I was going to school here, had a colored bank on the corner of Broadway and Magnolia Street, owned by colored people. I don't know another other colored bank in the state of Florida, but Old Keller had a bank, colored bank. All up and down Broadway was colored businesses, black-owned businesses. Dr. Hampton owned most of Broadway, the businesses on Broadway. I'm, I'm not a... Getting back to Rose Woodland, <clears throat> when we first moved there, we needed all kinds of equipment, uh, refrigerators, this, that, and the other thing. So we went up to, what was that store? The uh, Anyway, we went up to the store, we seeked out purchasing the refrigerator, the store, everything that we needed for the house. All right? We paid for it. And must have been about a couple of months later, the proprietor came down to the house. He said, you know, uh, I'm getting in some new supplies, and if we can bring your equipment down to you. I said, okay, what are they? So he, he came down that day, so he said, uh, you know, let me, before you get excited, let me tell you this. I sold yours, but I bought you another one. I said, you did what? He said, I sold what you had, but I bought you this. I said, I didn't purchase that. I got what I bought. So he said, what? I said, you wanted me to have that, but I wanted what I bought. He also had our sale receipt on the side of the cash register. So everybody in town could see what we bought and how much it was cost. So I said, you know what? You just give me my money back. You can leave that here, but I still want my money. And I said, to make sure the check is good that you go to write me, I went to the bank with him to see if the check was good. He said, you're a tough lady to deal with. I said, you don't know how. 
He was running for county commissioner. I said, you know one thing? I wouldn't vote for you anyway. I said, you don't even know how to do business properly. I said, you're a phony. No, no, no. I'm an upstanding individual here. I don't care. You did this wrong. I said, let me tell you something. If you and your boys come down here in some white sheets, I'm going to fill you so full of holes, you're going to look like Swiss cheese. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, oh, no, 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 no. Oh, no, I don't belong to that organization. I said, well, I'm just letting you know right now, if you come down here, you'll be all flat out there looking like Swiss cheese. <laughs> <laughs> so he left. We have had some pretty bad times down there, you know. And that was when you first came down? Yeah, that's when we first moved into so, Florida. That's Tell around what time? box. Um, rats in the mailbox. Oh, all kinds of things. It would, they would, the fellas would go out there and they would shoot a deer or something like that. They would skin them and leave them in the road. Mm -hmm. So we would either have to go around them or whatever. They would put, like she said, rats or anything into our mailbox. they just leave them in there for you? Of course. They oh. wanted us to see. Well, yeah. <laughs> And when we first moved there, it was Reynolds Road, the paper company and whatever they made, named it, Reynolds Road, after us. Hmm. But after a while, they took the sign down there and they put up a number road, wasn't it, Ronnie? Hmm? It was a number road that they put well, up. Well, the paper company said they gave an easement to this road. You know, the road was there, but it wasn't drivable. Hmm. So, I forget the man's name. He lived in uh, Williston. He was in charge of the paper company. He sent his crew out there and put two, it was a creek running across the road in two spots. He put two covers in and graded it for me so I'd have a road to drive in and out for my property. That's what the paper company did for me. And he put a sign up there that said, Reynolds Road. And it was in the U post office in Chiefland. On the, on Chief the map. On, on the, the map on the in map. Chiefland. Reynolds, Reynolds Road. Road. They, had, they had three roads. They had Moody Road, Reynolds Road, and Purdue Road. Now, let me tell you what they did. When the, <laughs> later on, they came down, they put took the wooden signs down. They put a metal sign say Moody Road. Came down to my road, took my sign down, threw it in the bushes, because I found it in the bushes, and put 41st Street. They went on down to Purdue Road and put a metal sign that said Purdue Road. And it's just like that now. That's right. I'm not joking. Wow. I, I'm going to tell you, Levy County something. Oh, let me tell you, uh, getting back to Levy County, the reason we live there, mm -hmm. see, I retired from Washington, D.C. And I was I said, well, I'm going back home to live because I'm not going to come back to Florida because I couldn't pay the taxes up there. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, let me say this and I'm going to go on with the story. Sure, sure. Last year, I went to get my daughter. She was in Maryland. Mm -hmm. I decided to go by my old house when I used to own it in, in Washington. I bought this house, 721 Farragut Place, in 1959, for $11,500, 1959. I sold it in 1963 for $16,000. I thought I got over. <laughs> Two years ago, I went to get my daughter from Maryland. I decided to go by and see what the old house looked like, 721 Farragut Place, Northeast, Washington, D.C. It was a for sale sign on the lawn. The house was the same, no, no nothing. And they had some brochures right outside where the for sale sign was. Beautiful home, finished basement, which I finished before I left because I remodeled it. You guess how much that house was selling for? 
Say about seven hundred thousand. That's, That's what it sold for seven hundred and fifty thousand. But then I, I say, ah. mm-hmm. <laughs> That's exactly what it sold seven hundred and fifty thousand. I, I, I can't believe it. Well, let's get back to what I'm saying. <laughs> Well, when I left Washington, I came to Old Keller, my old homestead. Yeah, I don't know you. You may not know Tucker Hill, here in town. That's where the old homestead was. Okay. Yeah, well, I stayed there, but I wanted to live in the country because I wanted to raise chickens and if I wanted some pigs or whatever. Nobody say well they stink and they this that and other. Well, when I left Old Keller to go north, we had chickens in the, in the yard, chicken yard. We had a cow that I I hated because I had to take out and steak her every day, the milk cow. But now they pass the law. You can't have chickens in town anymore and cows and things like that because it's residential now. They got all this. Residential and business and all that other stuff going, codes and whatnot. Well, I graduated from Howard Academy mm-hmm. High School. Been on to up New York and whatnot, up north. Well, when I came back to O'Keller, I looked for some property in the country where I wanted to live. When I left Old Keller back when I graduated, you could buy any acre of land here in Marion County for five or six hundred dollars an acre. But while I was gone, they brought these horses in. The horses wasn't here when I left. But these horses came in here. The land went from five or six hundred dollars an acre to five or six thousand dollars an acre. I said, well, I can't afford that. Mm-hmm. So I was looking around, and they had a sign out in Blitzton say, three acre ranch at $1,500, $500 down. So I went and I, you know, drove out there, t- talked to the man. He said, this is not what you want. I said, why? He said, well, this is it's not what you're looking for. I knew what he was talking about. He didn't say it in so many words. But we, this wasn't for colored folks. That's what he was trying to say. Mm-hmm. Huh? Mm-hmm. He said, well, I know a man that sell you some property, you know. So he called Joe King. Jim King. Jim King in chief. Him. He said, meet this man. He'll be in a Cadillac at Otter Creek. I had never heard of the Water Creek. I <laughs> he said, well, I said, Otter Creek. He said, oh, yeah. You go up here, and you hit 19, you make a right turn, and you go up, you see the signs of Otter Creek. He'll be sitting there in the Cadillac. So I did it. So I talked to Jim King. I, he, he said, what are you looking for? I said, I'm looking for about five acres where I can raise some chickens and hogs where I won't be bothering anybody. So he took me to a place and said, this is five acres. I said, how much is it? He said, $750, $750 an acre. Well, I had $3,500 in my pocket. I said, so, I was going to pay him cash money <laughs> right there for the five acres. He said, oh, no, no, let me show you something else. So he took me a couple of more places, say, lemon hundred for this, and 10 acres, and 800 for this, and that. I said, no, no, I'm satisfied with the five acres. He said, let me show you one other place. So he took me to Rosewood. I, I didn't know nothing about no Rosewood. I never heard of the place. And we went up. Not the road that I used to go to the house, but it was another road that came in from the back way. See, like I knew it was, it's still there, but they got it fenced off now. Mm-hmm. Brought me in, and when I came in, on both sides of the road were nothing but palmetto trees, them palmetto palms. Oh, yeah. Beautiful. 
He said, this is 40 acres. He said, 40 acres, $400 an acre. I said, no, 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 no. But I looked at it. I said, well, let's, he said, well, let's go to town. He goes, sign up for the five acres. You know, I'll go buy it. So when we got to his office, I say, they're 40 acres. Would you take $300 an acre for it? He said, no, no, he can't, do it. he can't do that. So he went back in his office. He come back, he said, can you give me $500 down? I had $3,500 in my pocket. I said, will you take a check, an out-of-state check? He said, yeah. So I wrote him a $500 check on the Bank of Washington, D.C. For the 40 acres in Rosewood, not knowing what I, <laughs> but what it was, I finally found out that the property that I bought once belonged to colored people. That the rich white people in Chiefland Bought for taxes. Got when all the people colored left. people ran away, escaped from the massacre was all. Mm -hmm. They left the property, and all the rich people in Chiefly bought all the property down there. The property I got, Drummond, Lucid Drummond's. <laughs> The man who owned the bank in Washington, he got Luger Drummond Bank right there chiefly now. His sister had our prop my our property. And I paid her for the property. My property was in a section of roads that they call Crooked Sapling. I learned all of this as years went by. But that's how I got the Rosewood. And what year was this? Huh? What year was this? 1977. I bought it in 1977. I was in Washington. I hadn't retired yet. But I bought this property in 1977. And then when I left Washington, I didn't go out to the property because I had lived, I came home to Okello. You know, because it was nothing out there but woods. So I got together. I, I drew the blueprints of the house that I wanted to build and took it down to the, you know, people. And they were nice about it when I first went down there. They took my blueprints and everything and gave me a permit. I forget what the permit called back in 1977. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't that expensive, about 2 or $3 a baby. I, I don't even know. But anyway, we literally built the house ourselves. The only thing I didn't do was lay the bricks. I had a man from Williston to lay the bricks. And when he laid the bricks, I bought furniture from the Scotties. And by and West, they had a place in the games called West. By and West, you get it for less. And get the best at West for less. <laughs> and, you know, I bought West that. Love huh? That's right, West Lover. <laughs> so I bought materials. All my roofing material came from West or Scotties. Mm -hmm. I'm not joking. I even had my wife on top of the roof laying shingles. <laughs> she yeah. always managed to get sick. That I ended up doing. No, I had her on the roof and I showed her how to put the shingles down. But we. We built the house. I'm not joking. And uh, cleared the land. And I even bought a bulldozer to clear the land mm -hmm. at, at, at one of the auctions. And I cleared it. It was, it was cheaper to buy than to rent it. I paid $2,200 for this bulldozer. Mm -hmm. huh? And I sold it for a thousand, so it actually it only cost me twelve hundred dollars. <laughs> but I cleared all of my fields. I made five different fields and whatnot. And so that's where I got the rosewood. And up until two thousand three. But I actually 
I liked it out there. Nobody liked it because it was so far out in the bushes and whatnot. But I, it, it it was a, it was a freedom that you couldn't ask for until the big buck people came along. Huh? And money, I'm going to tell you, talk. And money, money still talks because the county went along with the big money, even though I was a taxpayer, paying on a house and everything. That's more than what they were paying for the woods, because they, they had nothing on the woods. You know, no fr nothing else but woods. And it was a big corporation of rich people. So let me tell you, let me go back to Levy County. So when our hunting season came, was coming up, I said, Mama, it's time to get out of here, because hunting accidents happen. Since everything else was happening, and if somebody gets shot doing a hunting act, there's nothing done about it. It's just an accident. I'd be dead and that, <laughs> whatever. So I said, let's get away from here. Because I could see the hand writing on the wall. I had it, my home here in Oak, out here, where we live now, a drawer full of violation notices. Everything else that was standing out there on our property had a violation notice on it. The barn behind our house had a violation, two violation notices. One of them said it was an unsafe building. Then another one said I built it without a permit. I had an operating farm. The law in the state of Florida, which I happen to know a little bit about, says when you have a, a barn or a shed that's open on both ends, it's not considered a, sh a shed, it's called a pole barn. And you do not need a permit to build a pole barn on an operating farm, a, a permit. You don't, it's right today, it's on the book right, you don't need a permit to build a pole barn on your property on an operating farm, a permit. But I knew that, but that they put them on there anyway. I got all these permits, uh, I, I kept them. I kept them just for the heck of it, I don't know why. But you know what, after you've been on property, say like 25 years, everything should be grandfathered in. No, but they, they and nobody said nothing about it for 25 years. <laughs> that, but, but all of a sudden, when, the big buck people wanted to buy our property. I had violation notices. Now, I had a mule, a donkey, and two goats left out there. And uh, two dogs. They came out and cut the electricity off We had to pump the water, you know, my pumps and everything worked on electricity, you know. Mm -hmm. They put a violation notice down to the animal control fee. I wasn't feeding and watering my animals. I couldn't water them because they cut the electricity off to the pump. So I told, I said, let me go get, get these animals quick. Mm -hmm. So... They were on their way to confiscate my mule and donkey and the goat. And, and they had a nerve to say the dogs were running wild. Okay, loose. They were running loose on 40 acres in the woods. <laughs> Nothing out there. The dogs ain't going nowhere. <laughs> but they were running loose in, on 40 acres. I'm not joking. Leave the cat. I got, I got the notices black and white on a piece of paper. How well are you going to chain up a dog running loose on 40 acres in woods all around? They're not going anywhere. As a matter of fact, one of the dogs that was running loose died right here in Old Keller. And I took her to get rid of her because I didn't want her anymore. I took her to town and let her loose. You know, that dog came all the way from Chiefland, all the way back home. <laughs> 
Wow. He did. That's diamond. <laughs> did he, mama? Mm-hmm. Diamond came on. I said, well, if you did that, diamond, you going to stay here for the, you got a hole for the rest of your life. <laughs> that was not, and on top of it, diamond was a good dog. Yeah. <laughs> she was a good dog. She was a German shepherd. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm a, huh? That was a big dog. Yeah, let me tell you. Diamond was protective. Every, oh, man, you couldn't beat her. But you know, when she died, she never did this before. When she got ready to die, she jumped up in the bed and laid down. You remember, Mama? She was in the got in my granddaughter's bed and laid down and died. But Diamond came home. But I went out there with my trailer and got my animals, the mules and the goat and the dogs. The county was right behind me to come and confiscate them. And let me tell you, getting back to the property, I say, when I went to Century 21 or somebody here in Oak Keller to sell the property, the man put a for sale sign on it at the road. For sale. The people in Levy County, Buck Buck people probably, took the sign and threw it in the bushes. The man came out, he said, What's well, happening? I said, I won't. He put another sign out there. That sign disappeared too. So I said, Well, the only way to sell it now, to get rid of it, is to go through chief. So I went back to where I bought it from Jim K. He paid. But his son running the property. Real estate now. Jim King Realty. He's still on Main Street in Chiefa. Hmm. I went out. Doug, Doug, his name was Doug. Doug King. I said, Doug, I want to sell a property. I got to buy for your property. You know who bought it? Hmm. A doctor from Port Ritchie. In the big buck click. And he didn't pay what the property was worth. He didn't pay what the property was worth. My property was worth after clear with fence, fence and fenced in fields and clear it was worth a half a million dollars. At least I'd say three hundred thousand at least. That was getting cheap at three hundred. But I didn't get that. But I said, well, okay, you got a deal, I sold it. I said, good riddance. I got more than I paid for it. And I'm not hurt. I got a place here. And I don't worry. When I came here, yeah, you know, at one time, you know, I, 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 I say, I've been lucky all my life. My daddy died and I inherited 40 acres in Columbia County. Hmm. I, I, that's my stomach. That's, that's I, my, I inherited 40 <laughs> acres. Ago. They, the people up there, just to show you how Columbia County, just like Levy, they took two acres of my 40 and sold it. They say you never had forty. You only had thirty-eight acres. Even though I've been, pay- I paid taxes on forty acres for years. I said, "What about all the money I paid in?" Ta-? Well, you write the state, see if you can get your money back. You know that's like getting money out of this soap. Yeah. <laughs> you know I said, well, <laughs> but I, you know I, I'm supposed to go to, and to show you my daughter. The one that's right here. Mm-hmm. The one right here. Went up there with me when they stole them two acres from me. They threw her and me and everybody out of the office. You get out of the office before we call the police and lock you up. <laughs> Lee, Columbia County. So what it was, the 40 acres I had there, I wanted $3,000 an acre. I say, no longer do I want $3,000 a day. I want $3,500 a day. Anybody want to buy it? That's what it costs. It. So a man came to me and said, I want to buy the 40 acres, the 38 acres you got. I say, 
I want $3,500 an acre, and I don't want nothing taken out of it, no this, that, I want $3,500, period. If you can do that, it's yours. If you can't get there with nothing to take it out, it's not for sale. He bought it. I got $35. <laughs> because he's supposed to pay the taxes and all the things. I don't want to pay nothing. I want $3,500. Coach <laughs> Mock, I looked at what he, he went up there. See, told that, uh, he made, he, he made a, a community out of it. Mm -hmm. Homes. He put homes on the 40 acres. He sold them probably for a hundred thousand a piece or something. He made money, you know. I don't care. I made some money. <laughs> but you know, getting back to Rosewood, uh, Miss Dupree had a group. I can't remember the name of your group here. Rosewood Heritage Foundation. Rosewood Heritage Foundation. Well, they would come out and have tours, and we would cook dinner and everything for them. Sometimes we would need it. Our yard, or we would go up to the uh, down to the uh, museum. museum, or we or there, mm -hmm. and so I thought that was nice. Mm -hmm. that, and after a while, they left, and we left. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, I want to ask you, how well did you all know Scoggins? Scoggins, mm -hmm. Chevrolet. Oh, man. we know Scoggins and it is. Japanese wife? Yeah. Yeah, well, what's her name? Hungry or Monkey? Or, I forget her name. It's Fuji. 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 I know, I know something like that. Yeah, yeah we knew them pretty well. You know, well. we knew them, you know. Uh -huh. We knew everybody. And they knew us. In the area. Because they were local. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and, and uh, Scotland was pretty nice as far as, you know. I was going you know, I, I, I forget, I've been over there and asked him several things. Mm -hmm. And Scott, uh, Fuji mm -hmm. gave me a bunch of honey or something like that. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's right. They, they had, had honey. honey. They had honey. almost honeybees over there. Right, yeah, right. yeah okay. she gave me two, three jars of honey. And she said, whatever. I didn't buy it. She was selling it. She gave it to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, you know, I got along with it. You got along with everybody. Yeah, mm -hmm. well. Yeah. How about the Hodges out there? We knew them too, mm -hmm. uh, but the nicest man down there was the uh, when we had the house fire. He came and brought his trailer out there for us to stay on. Oh yeah! Oh oh yeah! Oh, oh let me tell you about Levy. Yeah, Can yeah. get back to Levy County again? <laughs> One of, he used to be uh, Rich, was Ridgeway. Ridgeway. I tell you, Ridgeway. Mm -hmm. He had a shop on the island, hmm. and then he sold his shop because I used to go down and sit. In, to the breather, he built a boat and I go fishing with him. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so uh, but he bought some property on three forty seven. Okay. Okay. He had a a trailer you hooked behind the house, the uh, truck to pull. Got it. Had everything, bathroom, cooking mm -hmm. facilities, and sleeping. You know. Mm -hmm. He said, since my house burned, use my trailer living while you. Rebuild your house with mm -hmm. Levy County came down and said, you cannot live in the trailer over two weeks. But that, and still the big white hunters can come up in November and with their trailers and stay till February hunting mm -hmm. in their trailer. But here I'm a property owner, couldn't live over two weeks on my own property. Mm -hmm. I'm paying tax. But mm -hmm. hunters that don't own nothing can come up in the woods, hunting club, and, and it, I, I can tell you, Lee, they, they, you tell me about Levy County. These are not <laughs> things that I'm making up. No, no, no. Levy County told me I could not live in the trailer over two weeks. But if you go out there in, in the area, most of the people live in trailers. Thank you. Most of the people. You yeah. go to you go to Chiefman. I can show you mobile homes where people been living for years in them. And that's what we point out when we go down. <laughs> but there. I here mm -hmm. out there in the woods, in out there in the woods in Rosewood, I couldn't live over two weeks. I'm not joking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's huh? Don't tell me about Levy County. <laughs> Did you have any uh, concerns huh? down there with the Baptist Church, the Rosewood Baptist Church? Did you ever have any response? 
with them and the car is well, we, we went to church down at something time, didn't we, Mom? Yeah, we did. But yeah. now they were, that, was it the Baptist the church? Baptist the Baptist church on the road. Baptist church, yeah. 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 Well, he bought his trailer, what was it, his bulldozer or something? Yeah, yeah. The, and, and clean the slab off so I could build my house back up. Okay. You know, all the debris on the top of the slab? Yes. He brought his uh, bulldozer in the sweep and swept, dug a hole. And swept it all the stuff on the top, all the stuff on the top of my slab, mm -hmm. and buried it for me. Mm -hmm. And covered it up and smoothed it up. And all I had was a, about two feet off the ground, a slab, concrete slab. All I had to do was build up mm -hmm. two by fours, go which I could do, just go get some two by fours and nail them together and stand them up. I got a wall, and I, it, you know, it's nothing to build enough, nothing, you know. Because all you had to do is, it's simple. Yeah. And I wasn't going to build no brick house again. I was just going to build two by fours and get some side in the wood side and nail to the two by four. You probably were going to stuff for it. Or something. Yeah, well, you know, I was not going to go put some <laughs> wooden slabs on the side and put some, uh, you know, they come in rows. It's mm -hmm. insulation, it's all in, in paper in the rows. Tack it in there, up there, and put sheet rock over top of it. That's it. That's what I was going to I could, I could do it, you know, but I'm not able to do all of that, yeah. those things. Now, I done got to the place in life where I don't want to build anything. You know, it's certain things I want to do, I get up in the morning. I go to bed at night say, I'm going to get up and do this, that, and the other. But when I get up in the morning, I don't feel like it. Okay. But I go to bed with the inspiration, I'm going to get up and I'm going to do this, that, and the other. <laughs> And when I do go out and get this ready to do something, something else happened. Like yesterday, I went out, I said, well, I'll go fix the umbrella. We had a high wind the other day and it broke some of the pieces in the umbrella over the way. The big strong wind came through there. And, and I had sticks where they broke off. I was going to, I bought some super glue and I was going to super glue them and tape it so I could put the umbrella back. The sticks is gone. And so I say, well, that, that, that's the end of the umbrella. For the sticks. <laughs> See, the sticks were the match where they broke. Mm -hmm. All I had to do was lay them together with the super glue and tape. Mm -hmm. But uh, they gone, so the umbrella gone now. Uh, $20 umbrella. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted you to mention a little bit about your ammunition, your guns, and the things oh, that you had in your house. They had a fire, remember? The, the, when the, the sheriff when wouldn't even let... There was one standing right there by the door. You can talk about that. Talk about about the, the gun you had right oh, there. Oh, man. The, oh, the police wouldn't even let me get to my... You know, I bought a shotgun. My mm -hmm. my son wanted to, me to leave it. He wanted to inherit my shot. It was a double-barrel shotgun. I bought a Sears and Robux. $60 I paid for it when I bought it. You know what a double-barrel shotgun, 30-inch barrel on it would cost you there nowadays? Four or five hundred dollars. But I had it right at the front door. You know, sitting there. You know, they wouldn't even let me get up to the front door to grab my shotgun out of there. Of course, the fireman was in there going through my things. <laughs> you know, getting what they want. They were inside, but I couldn't get to the door. You don't interfere with the fireman. They in there doing it. They in there doing, going through my things. Because a lot of things I saw even at the fire it was missing. I know basically what I had. And even if you have a fire, it should be laying on the ground or something. It wasn't there. Mention your coin collections, because you were a collector. Oh, man. Uh -huh. Mention your coin collections. I'm sure the people that are on that property now. You know what they... They, they, can, they really can. A lot of, a lot of people don't know. A mm -hmm. lot of people don't know. I was an avid coin collector. That's right. I had every Morgan Silver dollar except one. It came out in 1878. I had a seven-tail feather, 1878. Eight tail feather, eighteen seventy eight. The only Morgan silver dollar that I didn't have was the night eighteen ninety five. But I had all the rest of them. 
I had all of the peace dollars. Mm -hmm. All the peace dollars that came out after the Morgans, 1922. Mm -hmm. See, I, I, I knew that, you know, I could not collect it. And I got, I got, I started buying from the mint back in 1960. Proof sets. I got three proofs in the mint every year from 1960 up until 2003. That was the Philadelphia mint, that's a P. Denver Mint, that's a D, mm -hmm. and the San Francisco Mint. Do you know what a 1961, I think it's one or two, 1961 or 1960, you know what that one uncirculated set that I got from the Mint was worth today? $1,500. Either, any one of them, the D, the P, or the S, 15 of them, all burned up. I, I mean, I you see how this money had welded together. Oh, I got money. I, I got some half a dollars all welded together. Mm -hmm. I mean, where they crumple and weld silver dollars. Mm -hmm. You know, you know what that. Morgan, this the Morgans was worth from 1878. I, I, I have no idea what you could say, but just, just that 95 missing. Mm -hmm. A whole complete collector. Mm -hmm. But it took some out of me by coin collector. I tried to start collecting, but I don't have the, it, the uh, what did I forget the word I want to use? I don't have the fever to do it like I used to. Mm -hmm. I used to be running around <laughs> looking at coins mm -hmm. <laughs> because I had I started off with pennies. So my daughter started me off collecting pennies. I had a complete Indian head penny mm -hmm. from 1961. 1861 up until 1909. That's when the Indian head stopped and the Lincoln came out. See, I know all about that. Plus, I had the Flying Eagle Penny, which was the first small set. That was 1859, 1860. See, I, all that, I had all of that. And, you know, when all of them, and all my mercury dimes, all them pretty mm -hmm. mercury yeah, dimes. I had. The best collection I ever seen. I had. But I, I, I miss those silver dollars. I even got from the Mint back in 1970, I think it was 78 or somewhere along there, Carson City's silver dollars. It was made from the Carson City, in, they had the Carson City Mint Mall, CC, on the, on the, on, on the silver dollars. Comload stock, they called it the Comload Strike back in the 18th. Oh, yeah. I had all of it. And don't, don't, don't mention my paper money when they you know where the fire is. <laughs> I had, I had, I always kept a couple of thousand dollars in the, in the house. Always. All my paper money. I don't know if it burned up or the coaches wasn't there when the fire was over. <laughs> See, so I don't know what the fireman or whatever, but the paper money was gone. I know whoever has that property now, I know here. Yeah. Digging up riches, yes, yeah, still digging up money. They're still digging, yes, yes, yes. Well, this doctor, he, he, he was in the hunting club too. I, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. did you ever meet the guy? Mm -hmm. Huh? Yeah. Oh, the guy that bought the price, yeah, he had to come, we had to go to closing together. Yeah, 
he got it for li- he got it for way less than what it was worth. Coach, now to to him, it's worth something. To me, it's worth nothing because I had nothing left. The house was burned, <laughs> and all my animals and gone. I had nothing out there. And then she had all of the plants out there. You oh. had all kinds of flowers and plants. I mean, rare stuff. I haven't seen any more different kinds of bushes and all that that were out there. They were beautiful. And all that stuff. But yeah, you know, you know I lost, I lost, I lost, she had a greenhouse. Yeah. Yeah. I lost things in that fire that you couldn't you replace. You can't replace what you had. I had pictures of my grandmother. Yes. When she was a young thing. She was a beauty. Mm-hmm. My grandmother was a beautiful lady. I don't. I. I. I see what my grandfather wanted her, <laughs> but she was a beautiful thing. I'm not joking. I know. Cause now when she got older, she was wrinkled all up. Well, <laughs> but I mean, but that's the Indian. That's the Indian. Was, the Indian. Oh, oh, oh. Indian. <laughs> Would you believe? I'm gonna tell you something. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you go down to the park department. They got uh, brochures on Willoughby Park. In Ocala, mm-hmm. if you look at Willis Willoughby, he is your complexion, straight hair, and he married a Native American. That was my grandmother's father and mother. <laughs> <laughs> huh? Okay. But in the park, you know. Native uh-huh. Yeah, uh-huh. that was my grandmother, father and mother. Willoughby, Willis Willoughby, I don't know what part of Africa that white man with his straight hair that married an Indian came from. <laughs> well, he said, African American. Yeah. Would you go back and give us your mother's name and your father's name? I know you talked about them, but you didn't mention their names, so we have it for the record. Oh, oh. Just your mother's name. Oh, my mother's name, she was a friar. What's her full name? Huh? What's her uh, name? Her name was Amy Evelyn Fryer Reynolds. Oh, <laughs> All, All right, he's got it. And then your father's full name? His, his name was uh, Arthur. I, I don't know all of them. Arthur Reynolds. I, I don't know all of them, but no more than Reynolds. Mm-hmm. Arthur, yeah. Arthur Reynolds. And where was he from? Lake City. He was oh, Lake City, too. Okay. okay. Mm-hmm. You mentioned your grandmother too. What was her name? Her name was. She changed her name. <laughs> Most of us did. Yeah, it was, you know, they didn't like the. Oh, here come the, uh, the genealogy. <laughs> okay. Her name was Isabel. It was. Oh, go what? by go by both, Daddy, because you have two sets of families. So okay. You can tell yeah. the families that you have two sets of. Okay. Let me show here you. we go. You see it. Uh. Let me see. Oh, over here, who is this? That's Mary. That's that's mommy. So yeah. This is your. Okay. This is your adoptive, and that's your natural. Okay. Theon Freeman. Who was the grandson of the Okay. Grandson. See how I did that? You probably do it better than he is. That's him. okay. And this is this is <laughs> the title to the property where the Willoughby Park is. Mm-hmm. All right. I want to. You got a title to the property. Well, you got it from the president, yeah. You got it from the president. George Davis, Sylvia Robinson. That's my side of the family. Tell your side of the family. Sylvia Robinson. Tell your side. Tell your side. That's my side. And I have the death certificate. Sam Davis. Nellie Davis. Lenny, your side, that's my side. Oh, uh, <laughs> I don't know if it's on the back. I ain't see nothing back here. No, I, it's on the front, Daddy. <laughs> I don't know none of these people. Yes, you do, Daddy. Ciola, Thelma, that's, that's, Anderson. That's Javen's. No, you John. better give him children. Okay. Because he's, he's going to be a star of my family. Daddy, you have a unique set of uh, origins, remember? You have a biological set, and then you have a set that you were raised by. Okay? 
right? Yeah. Okay. So your biological family is the Willoughby's. That was your father's grandfather. Yeah, well, you, you, you tell them because you know more about it than I do. <laughs> I, I'm looking at this thing. I, I don't. I do know that that yeah, will be time. with my grandmother's okay. father and mother. You know, mm -hmm. I do know that. But other than I that, all, I don't know all them people. The but anyway, <laughs> I am the daughter of Leonard Reynolds. I'm his oldest child, and I have done some genealogical work of our family. My father has a unique origin in that. He was the biological child of one set of parents, but he was raised by another set of parents who actually were related to his biological set. Uh, his biological father was Theon Freeman, who was the grandson of Mr. Uh, Willis Willoughby and Odelia Willoughby, who came to Florida in the 1870s after a terrible uh, economic devastation in the state of Alabama, and they migrated by ox cart. He was a minister, and he brought a caravan of about 25 people from Lowndes County, Alabama, to settle around Little Lake Ware. He founded a church in 1888, no, 1883, which is still in operation today, and uh, it was called the Galilee Christian Church. The minister of the current that church currently is a descendant of Mr. Ruby, as is my dad and myself. I hold, my father probably has never seen this, uh, a copy of the death certificate of both his great grandparents that he has never met, of uh, Mr. Willis Henry Willoughby, who was born in Lowndes County, Alabama in 1848, who died in 19, let's see. In 19, uh, I think it's in the 20s, I think it's 19, uh, 1924, 21. And I have one of his great grandmother who was a Native American. We believe she was of the Creek Nation, but we cannot ascertain that for sure. But we definitely know that she was a Native American because the story is told in the family that there were times when they would have um, powwows we'll call them gatherings. Um, um, the Native Americans didn't necessarily call them powwows. That's what Americans call it. They would have gatherings, and she would leave her family and go off. She would leave her husband and her children and go off to the family gatherings with her Native American people and be gone for some time. Her name was Adelia Willoughby, and she was born in 1858, also in Alabama, and she died in 1916. Well, here's a copy of her death certificate and his death certificate. But my father was raised by his biological mother's older sister. And so his mama that raised him was named Amy Fryer. Got that right? And she married Mr. Arthur Reynolds. Now, even Mr. Reynolds' name shouldn't be Reynolds. Because his <laughs> real name should have been probably, what, Brooks or Woods' daddy? Hmm? <laughs> Brooks, the Brooks or Woods, but he took the name of the man that married his mother to help that family along. So I am the, the Reynolds of a Reynolds who isn't a Reynolds, but we go by Reynolds. But biologically speaking, he would not be a Reynolds. But that's okay because the Reynolds name has bode well for us, hasn't it, Daddy? Hmm? <laughs> I, 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 I got a <laughs> by the death certificate that he has never seen. <laughs> anyway, and he didn't tell you about it, but his grandmother, Miss Emily Isabel, or Isabel Emily, was Williams. Her mother was named Melissa Morgan, and she married Mr. Amos Williams. And I had a copy of their marriage certificate. They married in 1878 in Lake City, Florida. And they had two children. My my grandmother, great grandmother, Miss Emily Williams, and her sister Rebecca, right? Yeah, Aunt Rebecca. That was a she. She was a sweetheart. She loved me. Every time I go see her, she say, "Oh, Lenard, come in. Here. I'm gonna bake him a potato pie." Cause she. Well, let me tell you what she did. Years ago, they had what you call Watkins products. Uh huh. She they had Watkins liniment and Watkins vanilla extract. That's right. 
she made this pie and put watches Linderman in the son of the vanilla extra. And when I got to the house, he said, No, I made a mistake and I put with Linderman because it looked the same model. They said, Watch, you know. She, I say, Well, I say, Let me taste it all, Rebecca. I say, oh, it tastes all right to me. I eat it anyway. <laughs> but Aunt Rebecca, every time I go to she lived in Jacksonville. And every time I go up there to Jacksonville, I go to see Aunt Rebecca. I loved Aunt Rebecca. She was a sweetheart. <laughs> oh, she, was, she was a beautiful, brown-skinned, reddish-brown-skinned lady. Oh, man, she was something. Aunt Rebecca. Anyway, his back grandmother back. and his aunt that made the pies that he loved um, they lived in Lake City, Florida, and um, their mother died at the tender age of what was it, twenty or nine? Yeah, she was she was very young when she, she died. died. She died. She lived. She was maltreated as a slave. She was free at twelve years old. I heard my grandmother say, you know, tell me about how her mother was free at twelve years old, and. Uh, they stripped all her clothes off her and put her in the road buff naked in the wintertime. Mm-hmm. And her mother, Aunt Rebecca, somebody, Aunt Morgan, Grandma Morgan, they call her, took them one of them skirts, you know, them white skirts they wore under the clothes no they back in those days, mm-hmm. and wrapped up and took a child home. But she was sickly, mm-hmm. and she didn't live long. Oh, she lived long enough to have me couple of children, that was it. She died before the 1880 census, which is the, the best census that we have for looking at people of color after slavery. The 1870 census was the first one where black people were identified as human beings, where their names and, and identifications were recorded. Uh, I cannot locate her on the 1870 census, but by the 1880 census, his great-grandmother was deceased, but her grandmother and his grandfather and great-grandfather were listed in the Columbia County record. The 1900 record shows his grandmother, who was born the day that, what happened? Tell him what happened the day that Miss Emily was born. Well, she was born June the 2nd, 1876. And that was the day that Custer? Custer. No, no, well, no, Custer was killed at the little big home. But it wasn't the second of June. It was the twenty fifth of June. Well, I think. So correct. But I, re- I I remember the dates because my grandmother was born June the second, eighteen seventy six, and that was the same month that Custer lost his life at the Little Big Horn. It, it, you know. So that made her a centennial baby. She was born in the one hundredth year of our nation, right? Yeah, so 1876. So, yeah. And she lived to barely make it to the second bicentennial, but she missed it by three years. She lived to be 97 years old, and she lived here. Well, she would have made it there to put her in a nursing home. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they, when they took her away from that house on Tucker Hill, it did something to her. As long as she could walk around that house out there and, then would, and look at her chickens, mm-hmm. She was all right, but they said, no, you need somebody to take it. And they put her in that nurse and took her away from her home. That was it. But she would have still been around. She wouldn't have been here probably now, but she she wouldn't have went like she did. Mm-hmm. But she took her from her, where she was used to. Because mm-hmm. my grandfather bought the house in 1912. And I wanted to keep it because anybody coming home would always have a place to go. It was paid for. Because even when my daughter came down to Florida, she stayed in the old homestead. I stayed in it. It was a, I was an heir to the property. But I ain't gonna tell you what happened. We <laughs> lost it. It wasn't they lost, get, it was sold. It was, it was sold. It, it was sold. It was sold, it was given away, right? Well, it was sold. Yeah, it was sold for money, price. but I mean. But it was sold. Well, it was on, it, there's nowhere in Old Keller you can buy, I don't care what is a shack, on two lots on a corner in Old Keller for no $10,000. Well, it happened. Not, so but that happened. Anyway. <laughs> if I'd have had the $10,000, because I couldn't buy it because I already owned it. <laughs> See, it a, but they signed my name and uh, it went. Anyway. I didn't want it to go. Mm-mm. Is a five-bedroom house. 
It was wood, and it's still wood, and it's still standing. And there's a bunch of children that live in it to this day. <laughs> and they run through the yard and eat the pecans from the oh, trees. Oh, the tree back in the backyard. The great big pecan tree with paper shell pecans on it. My grandfather planted. He said, I'm not planting. I've heard it all my life. I'm not planting this tree for my children. I'm planting it for my grandchildren. Believe it or not, I am the oldest grand person, grandchild he had that's living. And if I want a pecan all day, I got to stand in the road and help one of them fall in the road because I can't go get in the yard. <laughs> Give the house away. I, you know, mm -hmm. you know. But like I say, I'm all right. God's been good to me because I'm still here. That's yeah. amazing truth. That's you have lived a lot of time twice. And he's been he's been a corpse and still walking. And I have been resurrected. Him. He was just yes. tired. He no, had more, he's had more than nine lives. He's been dead twice, but in addition to that, he survived being lost at sea twice. Twice uh -huh. being lost at sea yeah, twice. Twice, Daddy. You survived car accidents that Bronco flipped over and you crawled out and the car was smashed. Not a scratch on him. Uh, did you not yeah. survive a boat that capsized and you had to try to save your, your engine? Don't you remember that one up in Maryland? Yeah. Yeah, right. he survived the boat capsizing. Yeah, and and how many years ago were you lost at sea and they had to send the helicopters to find you? And Kenny, was that two years ago, Daddy? So that was Kenny, yeah. He went, but y'all were lost at sea. I, I wasn't lost, <laughs> but what happened is it was windy and I had my head down. My grandson had the boat wide open, going out and ran out of gas, wide open. He did. He said, "Where are we, Granddaddy?" I said, "I don't know." I, I, I was down there hiding, you know, from the wind. That would be no, considered no, lost at sea. No. But and you were I, rescued but, by them, the right? Coast yeah. Coast they, right. Uh, but, but what I was gonna say, I've been resurrected. <laughs> Cause, you know what I can't show you because I got a t-shirt but I can show you where they use those things where you put on your heart to bring it back I got a, a, a burn mark right there where my heart was so that means I was dead and they <laughs> shot, shot me back to life I'm not joking. But he's been dead more than once and come back because he's walking and talking. Ugh. But tell him, uh, okay, let's talk about this, the Willoughby Park. There is a park in Marion County. It's a beautiful place about maybe seven, six miles from where we sit it right, seated right now. And it was the remnant of a homestead of 150 plus acres that his great-grandfather settled on in the 1870s. And I was doing some research, and a friend of mine said, Mario, there's a book in the library oh, that's uh, called... President Arthur say Well, no, let me tell you about the book in the library. Talk about Little Lake Ware. And I'm reading the book, and it talks about all the famous people that were citrus growers in the 1870s. And I did not know this to be a fact. The book is called Lake Ware by T.M. Shackelford, and it was published in Jacksonville in 1888. And in the book, this is amazing. Yes, it was published in 1883, I'm corrected. And in the book, somebody has since stolen the book from the library. It wasn't I, because... <laughs> and it says, and I'm going to read this to you, it says, um, this is about the property that was around Little Lake Ware. The west and southwest of Little Lake Ware as yet has been improved, has but a few improved places on them, though they contain some pretty lots and fine building sites. Dr. E. C. Hood, who was a medical doctor, J. B. Carlisle, and Willis Willoughby, colored man, and perhaps one or two others, have places more or less improved and containing young orange groves. In the 1880s, in the early 1880s and late 1870s, his grandfather, great-grandfather, was one of the prominent citrus growers in Marion County. Hmm. I did not know that until somebody shared this book with me. And he would have still been a citrus grower had there been not two freezes back to back, one of December 1894 and another one in February of 1895 that wiped out almost all of the citrus in this part and they had to replant. He then removed his family away from the property, but they retained the land. 
And it went from 150 acres down to about 20 something acres. And his uncle who just recently passed away within six months or so, they got to the place where they could not continue to pay for the taxes on the land because it's sitting on the water. And what was a mosquito haven in the 1880s is gorgeous Florida uh, real estate today. It is worth a considerable sum. He was savvy enough to say, I'm going to keep it in my family, but I'm going to lease it to Marion County for 30 years. So it is a beautiful park. You can go down there and, 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 t and take uh, a view of it. And it's still our property, hmm. but it's leased to the county. Mm -hmm. And you can just imagine what it must have been like 100 plus years ago to have settled from Alabama on a 500 plus mile Oxcott traveled to find this place and the way he found it is because his wife was a Native American and Native Americans from all over the nation, even South America would come to Little Lake where it had a, it had its own name. I can't remember what the name was, but I had written it down at one point and they would have worship ceremonies down there. That's how long this has been a prominent piece of property in our family. Now we may not know the connection to the Native American side, but we know that it's there because that's how his great-grandfather found the land. And he settled along next to Carney, for the Carney Park, Carney Island. Mm -hmm. He was a neighbor of Mr. Willis. Oh. So this is, this was amazing history that I found <laughs> because I did not know, and this was published contemporary at the time, 1883, mm -hmm. by the Jacksonville Times Union Power Printing. <laughs> so the newspaper was around in 1883, <laughs> and it recorded it. So that's history. I want to mention one other thing um, uh, about his music. I want you to share a little bit about your. Uh, I his, think the best way for him to share it is for my father to play the piano and oh, let you good. all hear him. Because <laughs> he, 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 I mean, let me clear away the place so he could do that. But yes, he that, plays too. He, he plays, plays too. very well. He plays for local churches and honey. He's just a musician, natural. He's, he plays back here, but what's no, he reads music. He, yes, that's no, right. He that's reads. Right. No, no, no. You're right. He, he does read reads music because I went out to the house and he played for me and he pulled the songs out and that's right. You. Right. He can play classical. And he can music play too. classical too. He yeah. can play classical. You said all these things, boy. I used to be able to play classical. Oh, yeah. I'm sure that you can remember I, before your resurrection. You know what? I say I used to play classical. I say that for one reason. <laughs> when I was a teenager, boogie woogie was the thing. I used to play a walking bass on the piano. Boom, 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 you know, like that. I used to be able to, but do you believe I can't do it now? My hand will not. Yeah, it won't, it won't. Do it like you used to. I just boom, 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 boom. I just sit there and you do those puzzles all day long. <laughs> but not, but I believe it or not, I tried because I tried, but my hand will not. Yeah. I, 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 age, a little bit of age here, just a wee bit. Did it's you tell them your age, Daddy? My age? Yeah, tell me. Tell me age. Age. I'm 84 years old. I know. I'm 84 years old. <laughs> I think I am 84, 84 months. Yeah, you're 84. Yeah, so Can we, for the record, can we ask when you were born? Huh? What your birthday was. My birthday? Yeah. November the 23rd. And this year, November 23rd comes up, I'll be 85. So if I make it. What year was that, Daddy? Hmm? 19, what, 20? 20? 29. The year the, the nation crashed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the banks crashed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I grew up in depression. Depression age. Mary, you want to give them yours? So, so. Yeah, May 2nd, 1928. Okay. And then mention your children, each one of them, please, so we'll make sure we have those for the record. Okay. Well, that's the oldest right there. Well, Maria. Maria. Lynette. You nice. want her age? I, uh, I you know, tell women you don't tell her age. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. I, I, you know, care. I know. She said she didn't care, so you I don't, don't care. Tell her. All right. <laughs> her sister, Tanya. Wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait a minute. Hold on, hold on. Maria. Lynette. Lassen. 
Reynolds, Reynolds Lassen. Reynolds Lassen. And then you got Tanya Anita Reynolds mm -hmm. Harden. 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 You have, you and, have Junior. And Len then, and then you got Leonard Reynolds Jr. Mm-hmm. See, he's the one I don't know too well. I know mm -hmm. the ladies. Well, I know Tanya better than any of them. Yeah, well, Tanya's so something else. Tour. Mm -hmm. Tanya is, but she's yeah, she something too. else. <laughs> <laughs> I'm over to her house here in uh, Ocala. She gave me plants. And you know my flowers are li living that she gave me? Sure. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Oh, you haven't been there lately. I mean, she has she so got, many more. She got things. everything she around her house. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah, you know. I mean, exotic stuff. I'm not a yeah, common yeah. plant. <laughs> and she called me. I said, you better not bring another plant here. <laughs> you know I don't bring a plant. You know I'm going to. She told us, hey, that plant home to Mr. Hare. <laughs> I said, okay, I'm going to carry home to Mr. Hare. <laughs> so, can I ask a few questions for clarification? Yeah, you can ask me anything. Okay. Um, well, one... Just a small question. So you, this is your grandmother, Odelia, was Native American, correct? And you said... Great-grandmother. Great-grandmother. She used to go to powwows, gathering something. Was that in Florida, or did she go all the way back she to Alabama? She would go to the wolves in Florida and also in Alabama. Okay, so she'd do... Let, let yeah, me let me let me clear some stuff up. Let me you go have back. to ask my dog if okay. she know more about it. Let me go I know all the way back. Let me, let me, okay, my father is an... The only child of one set of parents, but not the only child of another set of parents. So let's go that way. He is the child of Amy Evelyn Fryer Reynolds. Amy Evelyn Fryer Reynolds. What about her? <laughs> that was the woman that raised you, right? Right. Amy Evelyn Fryer Reynolds. She was married to Arthur Reynolds. Now, they were both born in Lake City, Florida, Columbia County. But they didn't meet in Lake City. They met in New York City. Mm. Were married in Manhattan. And no, they, I think they met. They, no, I have their marriage has, license. No, married. no, I think they met. They're not in Lake New York. They met in St. Petersburg, Florida. Okay, but they married they met, in New York City. Oh, they married nineteen twenty-six in New York City. New York City. Okay, because I got I, marriage I, license. I, I, <laughs> okay, and then, but he is the biological child of Amy's younger sister. Minnie Pryor, right? Right. And he is the biological child of Theon Freeman. Mm -hmm. Theon Freeman was the son of George Freeman and Pauline Pauline uh, Willoughby. Pauline Willoughby was the daughter of Odelia Means, who married uh, Willis Willoughby. That's the great grandfather to him. Now let me go back on the other side. Miss Amy, this chair is making a funny noise. Um, Miss Amy and Miss Minnie were the children of Emily Isabel Williams, who married Joseph Fryer. Okay, the the Emily and uh, was the child of Amos Williams and Melissa Morgan. Melissa Morgan was the one who died as a result of walking pneumonia from having been. Uh, not treated well during slavery and died before 1880. She married Amos Williams, who later moved to Florida. I mean, not to Florida, he was already in Florida. He later moved from Columbia County down to West Palm Beach, Florida. Did you know that, Daddy? No, I didn't know okay. that. <laughs> I did not know that. So I've gone back as far as I can. Yeah, well, you, you said something I never heard. <laughs> I didn't know they went down because back not in 1800, him. Palm Beach no, no, was no, no, swamps. No, no, no. They didn't do it in the early age. They did it in the 1900s. <laughs> yeah. But you, what, what, but what, you know, people don't know. When you go down to Miami back in the 80s, you was in the swamp. That's true. I'm not You're joking. in the swamp still. They just no. sucked the water out of it. It's still a swamp. Oh, no, well, it's a city, big city now. But it's still sitting on yeah, the swamp. Yeah, but I mean, it's not swamp. Like, Palm Beach is beautiful now. You got coconut lime trees. There wasn't no coconut trees. <laughs> <laughs> it may be in the swamps. But back in those days, you know, old Keller, mm -hmm. when I was going to high school, all the roads around in Okella was sugar sand. Hmm. No paved roads. The only paved road you had was Broadway. But to get to Broadway, you had to go through the sugar sand all the way on every road in Okella to get to the paved road on Broadway. They were that way in the 60s, Daddy. 
They only paved them in the, in the late 60s. I don't know. But the, <laughs> all of them. I don't care. Gainesville had shit to I don't know about something. the white section because we didn't. You know, Old Keller was a place where we didn't have to mingle with the white section of town. Mm-hmm. Everything we ever wanted was in the colored section of town. Mm-hmm. I mean, all the businesses, all the. We even, even had a movie house called the Roxy Theater on Broadway. We didn't even have to go to the white folk movie because if we went to the white folk movie, we had to work up, walk up the fire escape. Mm-hmm. Walk up the fire escape and sit up in the balcony. Mm-hmm. Don't tell me. So we didn't go there. Mm-hmm. We went to the Roxy. Did you see it? What, what sort of movies did you see at huh? the Roxy? What sort of films did you see at the Roxy? Same thing they showed at the end. Well, whatever movies it was, you know, come out. They had the regular Michelle movies. had a lot of movies for the blacks in the yeah. 30s and 40s. Yeah. Michelle, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oscar. Mm-hmm. Well, you probably saw a lot of his movies. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, you know, back, back, back when I, you know, back in when I was going to high school here in Old Kellum, everybody of color, I don't care if you lived in Wesdale to the south, Citra to the north, Blitzen to the west, uh, Fort McCoy to the east. I don't care anywhere in Marion County. All people of color knew everybody. Mm-hmm. I, everybody knew everybody. I, I said the whole county because on Saturdays, you can find everybody up on Broadway shopping. They come from the woods. They can come to town. That is no longer. Nobody knows anybody any longer because it's not the same. But years ago when I was you could go up on Broadway, everybody was up there, all up in the middle of the street having a good time. I'm not joking. How about Paradise Beach? Oh, Paradise Beach. Was it Park. 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 Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that that years ago, Silver Springs, we couldn't go in the water to swim. You know, colored people couldn't go in the water in in the main park. We could go in the bushes and swim. We was a swimming hole down. They used to tell me don't go down the water because the suck hole will suck you in. Mm-hmm. But even though we went down and swam in it anyway, <laughs> but long came. They decided that we needed a place for the colored people. So they appointed Mr. Eddie Vereen, mm-hmm. manager of what, what, what's out there now they call uh, Silver Spring State Park. That was Paradise Park. Mm-hmm. It was a park where the, we had the glass bottom boats over there for colored, the swimming area for the colored, everything, you know, for color on that side in Paradise Park. And therefore, we didn't have to go over to the white folk people's side. So that's, but that's what, they, but that was there for a while, and I don't know what happened that they closed it yeah, down. Yeah, they finally it did. It closed, but it's now considered everything over there. Silver Spring State Park. Mm-hmm. You go out, what is that, 35th, uh, whatever that is. That's the County Road 35. 35. County Road 35, mm-hmm. you'll get to Paradise Park. It, it's behind where the, that the water park is, where that off, yeah. off of Silver Spring. Spring Boulevard. You know where the water park is, where the slide is? Mm-hmm. It, okay. it's, it's Silver Spring? Mm-hmm. Well, Paradise Park is behind there on that road. Mm-hmm. Okay. okay, well, all, all the... This is a new world, a new day and everything. Because on Saturdays, I used to go out to Silver Springs and put stickers on people's cars. And, you know, it's, it's stickers also said, a trip to Florida is not complete unless you see Silver Springs. Mm-hmm. And they give me little tips. I make my little change, you know, to get stickers <laughs> on people. <laughs> but now you can't even go out there because you got to pay to park. You got to pay to do this. You got to... Marion County is not the Marion County it used to be because... Even the boat ramps, you got to pay to put your boat in to go fishing now in America. But you can go right in, I can say in Levy County, I can go back to Levy County. <laughs> you don't have to, you can put your boat in mm-hmm. on free ramps. There's three ramps, boat ramps all over. 
Not only Levy County, you can go down to Lee County. Lake Harris, we got boat ramps. Every county except Maryland, you got to pay them. Go fish. Yeah, you know, that I tell you, it's not the Maryland County. We, we used to have fun. It was a good time. I had a good time back when I was a teenager. So we had uh, things for teens, you know. We had soda shops up on Broadway and everything for teenagers and whatnot. We had a good time. Did you have a favorite shop oh, yeah. up there? Huh? But it's not the same anymore. Huh? Did you have a favorite shop? Do you remember the names of Oh, well, uh, a couple of my classmates had a shop on, on Broadway. We call it, uh, they had dead. Both of them were dead. The Hunt sisters, the, uh, Ira Lee Hunt and her sister, had a shop where we gathered up there. Right there before you... It was right there on, Broad, uh, on Silver Spring Boulevard. You know where you go up coming into 441, it's a, going up over the old fashioned train track? Mm -hmm, I know that. Well, right down at this side at the bottom of the hill was this soda shop where we used to hang out. Right there. Mm -hmm. And talking about my grandmother, uh, Freeman, mm -hmm. she lived right down the street on Broadway. And her house was gone, everything on Silver Spring Boulevard. Her house was right there on Silver Spring Boulevard. All the houses are gone. They got grass growing around there now. All along there. Well, they got the street market was saved for Broad Street. And that's over there at the school. Um, Howard Academy. Uh, uh, Howard Academy. Yeah, they got it. And it's, it's out there in the back. Well, you yeah. see, well, the building they called Howard Academy when I was growing going to school was the elementary school. That's right. That was the elementary school. We had a two-story wooden building, white wooden building, mm -hmm. two-story, was the high school. And then we, in the middle of the campus was a, the gym, gymnasium. It was a big, big white building we had, and flow, you know, in a stage and an open floor. Mm -hmm. You know, and we had, that, we had 10, 10 cent socials you know, on that school on the night. And I used to play the band. I used to play the uh, piano, you know, and boogie woogie down, you know. <laughs> we have tents and so Everybody be out on the campus having a good time. That was good days. I hear you. Now, how, how did you learn to play? Mm -hmm. did you take, you learn while you were in school? Uh, you had some, who taught you music? Classic music? Mm -hmm. well, you believe it or not, believe it or not, I took lessons on the violin. Okay. That was my instrument, the violin. Mm -hmm. That's perfect. That's where I learned to read music on the violin. All right. I can I can read music for the piano, but not as well as the violin, because the violin got one, maybe two notes. But the piano got a whole bunch of Four notes on the written music. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I don't read piano music as well as I mm -hmm. do. The violin music. Viol now, I can read it well enough to play. Oh, yeah, you play. play. I, I, I read it well enough, to, but I don't be reading actually what's... On the paper. On know. the paper. <laughs> you don't know I'm reading. he knows how to improvise. No, well, I, I put my own you, you put two, your spin two on. cents in <laughs> what, what is it, on a piece of paper. Because I don't like... A lot of way the music written the way it's written. I don't like the way it sounds, so I I play so much of it from the paper, then I put my two cents in it too. You know, improvise. It's beautiful. Uh, you know, I cleared it, it, so it, you can play, Daddy. Huh? I cleared it so you can come over here to play. <laughs> <laughs> what do you want me to play for? Uh, something that you want recorded for posterity. What'd she say? <laughs> Something that you want recorded for posterity. I think that you have two signature songs. One is a song from Showboat. Fish gotta swim, birds gotta fly. I, you know how to forget it. And the other one is a religious song. Yes, my Jesus, Jesus cares. cares. Yeah. Because that is your song. Uh -huh. And we've heard that song for... 80 years now. <laughs> so, 
You can't remember you, you this guy's You can see the Native American in this young lady, can't you? <laughs> <laughs> That's my Jesus kid. Huh? Well, let, me, let, me tell, let, me, let me tell you, let me, let me tell you what. I, I'm going to tell you this, and I'll, I'll see if I can play. We travel across the country <laughs> on the southern border mm -hmm. from Florida to California. We stopped in Mexico in several places, Acuna, Mexico, and Mexicali. We stopped in Mexicali. A wife got kind of sick, so she went back into California, it was Calexico, California, to the drugstore. You know what Everybody left, and my truck was on the California side. We walked across the border. Me and my daughter was in Mexico. Mm -hmm. So they had an alert when all of a sudden when we got ready to leave, some people that crossed the border, you know, illegally, and they were detained. <laughs> <laughs> Take everybody, you know, all the Mexicans couldn't get out. So we got to the border. I said, America, hey, look at her. <laughs> <laughs> and, and my daughter said, Daddy, speak Spanish. I said, shut up. <laughs> speak it quickly. <laughs> <laughs> because I thought I was a child that was supposed to get on the bus with the other Mexican children. <laughs> this is true. So they did not let us leave. And I do speak Spanish, and he does too. And until she came, they didn't let us go. <laughs> I had to bring all of the identification back, so... <laughs> Talking about speak Spanish, Dad. I said, check out <laughs> What did you say to me? <laughs> You know, the <laughs> we, we have we have lived a wonderful life. We have traveled everything. We built a boat, but we bought a boat, and we came from Maryland, we Maryland to Florida. That was a trip. Oh, I sailed my own boat now. You know, yeah, you told me about it. you came. Yeah, we came in the I, I, I brought my boat down from Maryland. Mm -hmm. They we had a 30, 30, 30 Three or thirty-one or thirty-three foot cabin cruiser. Mm -hmm. It's either or. I I don't forgot now. But anyway, the ship in the Florida, you had to have different uh, laws for each state. From Maryland, mm -hmm. they had some. You had to have escorts, and some had you could. Oh man, it was a message. You know, to ship a boat from up north down at on the highway. I told my wife, we ain't gonna ship it. We gonna oh, sail. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody said, you, you go what? <laughs> I said, we're going to run this boat. <laughs> and they said, you, you sure you can do it? I said, I'm going to do it. I backed my boat up and filled it up with fuel, blew my home, woo, woo. Down to Chesapeake Bay I went. <laughs> I stopped that night in Virginia. I do the hook over in Virginia. I was in Virginia waters. Took my fishing pole, fish, caught our breakfast. I'm gonna let you talk, Mom. No, 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 no. I'm gonna let you talk. No, no. Anyway, we had breakfast. Then I went on down. Uh, well, I forget what I did. But anyway, we got to uh, was Virginia Hampton. It was the Hampton, Virginia, where we tied up. Okay, yeah, after Virginia, and uh, we tied. We spent a couple of days in Virginia, in Tyson, and you know Hampton and all that. Uh, what's that? Uh, I know the part. I can't even. What well, naval base is? Albemarle Sound, North Carolina. No, no, no. Virginia is the naval base. <laughs> Down Norfolk. Here. Norfolk. 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 Now, I got there. I couldn't take, you know, my memory is not good like you. But anyway, 
after we left, I had to pull my boat up in the bushes because aircraft carrier was coming out and it took the whole channel. I mean, uh -oh. it, it was coming out. All the boats had to And we had to pull in the, in the swamp to get that boat. To, <laughs> that aircraft came, the forest storm. The forest storm, that's The right. forest storm. She was coming and sailors was waving and all that. It was beautiful. All of them standing out there in the white uniform. Yeah. They were waving to everybody. Yeah, it was really cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but you know one thing? That was a treat, trip worth, well worth doing. Because we, you know, they, they very seldom, let me tell you, from Maryland to North Carolina, you found black people on the, on the water. They had boats. Uh, My boat looked like a rope. My boat looked like a rowboat to some of the black folks' boats in North Carolina. <laughs> it was a black man bringing his boat down from Connecticut, laid back, pushing buttons, <laughs> driving. <laughs> the reason I know, because I was looking to get some fuel. He said, I just got fuel over here. I said, well, he said, well, throw a rope up and I'll throw you throw back. I threw a rope up and tied his boat and I had to climb the ladder to get on his yacht. <laughs> and he's laid back there pushing buttons, <laughs> running his boat, man. And he had three, I ain't gonna say, big fat ladies sitting on the back eating watermelon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, he pulled me back in and I filled up. But now from Maryland, Virginia, and North Carolina, you found black people with big boats. <clears throat> Mohead City, we yeah. stayed two or three days. When we left Mohead City, hit South Carolina, that's when we were straining. Black folks didn't have boats from South Carolina, Jordan, and none of them places, because we had to go through the swamp. They had little dugouts like, <laughs> in the swamps in South Carolina. But up until North Carolina, we were strangers when we left that coming. We was in the intercoastal. Mm -hmm. Intercoastal. So uh, what happened is, when we left South Carolina, we got to Georgia, a storm came up. So I said, we better pull in, get out of this storm. So I pulled into a, a, a river like coal, <clears throat> and I tied up to a dock out of, out of the way of the storm. And I, I looked at the chart and said, uh, 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 Six foot drop in time, so I tied my rope six foot. That was in the. That it was, was a nine end. foot drop yeah, instead of six foot drop. In the, in so the canal it was. In the morning when I woke up, my boat was hanging in the air <laughs> <laughs> up from the dock, and I didn't know it, but I had to cut the rope to get the boat back down to the water. So I cut the rope so it fell, but when it fell back to the water, it knocked the generators out. I didn't know that the dock we tied up to was the United States Ammunition Depot. And the night before, the day before, they had brought all the ammunition in, and it was thundering and lightning all night long. And if we had blown up, nobody would have known. No, but now let me tell you, I had to call, I had to call the, the Coast, Coast Guard, Guard. That's how because my... Generators went out but my radio. I called them on the radio, and they had to get permission to come in in because I was in prohibited waters. For <laughs> well, I said, "Well, I didn't know nothing about no ammunition dump back in the, you know." But they had to get permission to come in to get me. That's how we found it out. He said, you know, we had to come in here to get you. Said, For what? <laughs> he said, you only United tied up the ammunition <laughs> depot. You know where you probably were in Kings Bay, Georgia, right? Well, they, 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 were, they knew we were seeking shelter. Yeah, they knew. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, 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 they were nothing to me. We wasn't coming in to do, to do no damn out. Mm -hmm. It was storming. Storming. So, mm -hmm. We seeking shelter. So when they came and pulled, they pulled me from Georgia to Fernandina, Florida, mm -hmm. in the Florida, mm -hmm. into the, so I could get the boat fixed and generated. Mm -hmm. And I got tired of the intercoasters. 
I, I put it in the ocean twice. I put it in the ocean and all uh, up at Albemarle Sound. And my wife was down below. She was fixing dinner. And she looked out the port and we were starting to ride, you know, like, you know. And she looked out the window. And when she looked out, she see number water. So she said, where are we? She up there, where are we? I said, we're all right. And my son was with us. She said, little Lenny, where are we? <laughs> He said, we in the ocean, mama. <laughs> <laughs> she said, get back. But I, I was out there. I was riding high on the ocean. So I had to look for an opening to get back into the coaster. I got tired because I had to wait for bridges to open up and mm -hmm. all that. I said, I was riding the ocean. I was riding, you know. <laughs> so uh, I went. But now, that's the first time I got in the ocean. When we got to Daytona, she got off. Left my son and I, we were on our own. So when I took the Intracoastal all the way to Stewart, Florida, went through the St. Lucie Canal into Lake Okeechobee, crossed Lake Okeechobee into Clewiston, Florida, which is in the Caloosahatchee River, and that Clusafi River ran into Fort Myers, which put me in the Gulf of Mexico. When I got in the Gulf of Mexico, I looked at the chart, and from Fort Myers to Cedar Key, straight across the ocean, I said, son, we going. We ain't going to fool with this intercoastal anymore. Your mama gone. <laughs> <laughs> I put her out there and I rode her and we came up on a storm before we got to see the key and I pulled in the Christie River. The key seek shelter and the man said, Why don't you stay here? I said, No, we're going to see the key. Well, the next day the storm was started and I took her on in to see the key. And that was the end of me and Mark Tar Reynolds. And the beginning Mark of Rosie. Lenny. <laughs> Mark Tar Lenny. And that was the beginning That's of Rosie. Wow. I drove it all the way around, all the way down from Maryland in the Cedar Key, Florida. And, and, and let me tell you, the white folks stole everything off my boat. Yeah, they, they were stealing. They, was, they stole the compass. I had a built-in compass on the dashboard. They took that. Oh, I mean, they just stripped my boat. <laughs> Talking about, because there wasn't no black folk down in Cedar Key. Mm -hmm. All the white folks stole all the equipment off my boat. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you. Mm -hmm. but we oh, that's when I first got there. <laughs> and then after they stripped it, they took the generators off my engine. And I had to take the engine up to... I think uh, we were paying it, paying it, you know. For, yeah, I was paying them $30 pay, pay a, a month. month. Wow. The park, they charged me about a foot, you know. So I said, what size boat? I said, 30 foot, you know. So they charged me $30 a month. But when they took the generators off my engine, I took the engine up to Thompson Garage in Chiefer to fix it. And a man came and he said well, he wanted to buy my boat. I, and they, oh, they took the railings off my boat, everything. <laughs> I mean, they stripped my boat. So, fish fighter, you know. <laughs> so I said, well, I gave him $3,500. Give me $3,500 and take it. And he took the edge and got Thompson to fix it for me. And I understand he was running dope. <laughs> he was running from Cedar Key down the coast, <laughs> running dope. He says they stripped everything off the boat and made it like a cargo ship. <laughs> Instead of, uh, uh, you know, it was, it was a cabin cruise because we had bunks, you know, they shower and all that. But, you know, what they, they they were shocked to see a black man coming with a great big boat coming in the sea to keep it up. They, oh, coming across down to St. Petersburg, I come across that sound down in St. Petersburg. I laid back with my feet up on the steering wheel. Cruising, you know, <laughs> and the Florida Marine Patrol came by and they looked over and looked at me. Saw me laid back with the same feet up on there. 
And they looked at the numbers that had Merrill the numbers on it, you know. They did a big sweep around and came back and took another look. I said, <laughs> they, they, they didn't say nothing. They just, they just you know. <laughs> but, you know, we, we've had, you know, we had a pretty exciting life. I, I can see. I have been, you know, I can say, I can tell people, you know one thing, I have been around the world two or three times on the ocean. I say around the world two or three times. When I say I've been there, I have left New York City, crossed the Atlantic Ocean, round the Rock of Gibraltar, through the Mediterranean Sea, down to Fort Said, Egypt, down through the Suez Canal, up the Malacca Straits into Japan, from Yokohama, Japan, to Honolulu across the Pacific, to Honolulu, Hawaii, from there back to Balboa, Panama, through the Panama Canal, and across the Gulf of Mexico, round Florida, back to New York. If that ain't around the world, I don't know what it is. <laughs> now, I've done it several times. I stopped in different places. Mm -hmm. I've been in different foreign countries. I, did. I sat in the Temple of Zeus, where Nero sat. I had my picture taken in, in Greece, Af in Athens, Greece. Mm -hmm. Temple of Zeus, the Parthenon, I've been there. I was, oh man. I've, I've been to so many different places. I've been to, I've been to London, England. You don't want to talk about your huh? job. Uh, oh, I've been. I'm not talking. You, want, you don't want to talk about your job in Washington. Oh, my job in Washington. Oh, I walk. With, you know what they? I walk with kings, presidents. I was security for heads of state. I was security for the Shah of Iran. I was security for Anwar Sadat, president of Egypt. Well, the first man I worked for was Abba Ab Eben of Israel. And then, oh my goodness, I can, oh, I was even security for Prince Charles and his sister Margaret mm -hmm. when they were children. You know. What was it? What was the German man that came over here and gave you a case of vodka? Oh. I can't remember. Who was that? The, I don't know, whatever the big man was over there in Germany, he gave you a case of vodka from Germany. Oh, that was up at the, the Russian embassy. Well, that was up at the Russian embassy. They gave me this vodka. This <laughs> 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 but I, maybe was, you know, I couldn't name all of it. And as far as those are some of them. But all the black dignitaries, I handled it, came to Washington. I was mayor, the first mayor of uh, Washington, D.C., was Walter E. Washington. Mm -hmm. He was the first mayor, and I was his right-hand man. He even called me up on New Year's Eve. I said, I'm off this mayor. He said, well, I need you. Come on. I had to go to work. <laughs> he wanted me for a reason. He wanted me for a reason. I, and I, I happened to know the reason because I... I do the same thing. Pain in the neck with it. I do it the same thing. Each year, the first person to cross your threshold mm -hmm. has got to be a man. So when I took the mayor out to party New Year's Eve, I had to get out of the car and walk in his house first before I could go back to the car to help him and his wife out of coming out. Mm -hmm. So I was the first man to cross over that threshold. Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, I knew what he wanted because I've done that for <laughs> even locked his own children. You cannot come in my house until a man crossed my threshold on New Year's. Mm -hmm. On the New Year. It's just an old it's a superstition. It's a superstition. They say it's, it's bad luck. It's bad luck if a woman cross your face on the first day. And so I say, well, I don't know if it's superstition or not. 
You just say cross the body. <laughs> I my children, if they go out, they could not come home. They could find somewhere. I'm not coming. No, I know. I locked the door. I'm not coming. They couldn't come in. Whoever's in there is in there. And the first one to cross that on New Year would have to be. And they'll tell you. They couldn't come home. They'd go out and talk about a New Year's party. <laughs> Better get home before midnight. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's some, you know. And then what was, who was cool. I don't know if you remember his name. He was the vice president of the bank of oh, our oh, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah, he, gave, he, came, he came over. No, he, yeah, he, he was in an accident. He spoke only Spanish or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then he could speak Spanish. Well, you know, I can't remember all them people. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it and was one man, man I never heard of until I, I took him Is it over yet? to Dully's Airport. Mm -hmm. I took this man to Dully's Airport. Mm -hmm. uh, he was the president of Mauritius. I never heard of Mauritius. Mm -hmm. So when I took him to the airport, put him on a plane, he was going to London, he hugged me and kissed me on both my <laughs> cheeks. And he said, come visit us in Mauritius. Because you look like a Mauritian. He said, I look like a Mauritian. He was a brown skinned, you know, man, Indian man, you know, from Mauritius. So when I got home, I looked on the map to find out where Mauritius was. It's a tiny island in the Indian Ocean. And what not? I ain't I ain't, never, I ain't never heard of it until I took him to Delhi, you know. But I was, I was, it was a whole lot of dignity. Oh, like, man from, what was it, Whitney Young from New York? Yeah, that was your, yeah, yeah Whitney your, Young. Yeah, that was your buddy. Yeah, he, 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 he called me a washing up. He said, he said, Walter, have Reynolds meet me at the airport. And he wanted a Chinese car. Bring a nice Chinese car. Meet me at the airport. He was the last one to put him on the I put the him plane, on the airplane to died. go to Africa. You remember he died when he was over in Africa. Yeah, Whitney Young. All those autographs and things that we have received from all these people that he has come in, con in contact with. All gone. Oh, all, gone. all You know, I had things from all the presidents. I, you know, I used to, you know, the thing about my main man, was Tricky Dick, Little House Nixon. That was my main man. Yeah, a lot of people say he's Republican, they don't like Republicans and all that. But Tricky Dick was my main man. He raised my salary from little or nothing to a livable salary. Mm -hmm. I don't care what that <laughs> He raised my salary to a livable salary. Plus he liked pomp and circumstance. He call up. He call up and say, "Come get him. He want to go to the boat. You know, mm -hmm. the, the Sequoia boat in the, in the river. And he wanted. He liked the sirens blasting and the red lights and the whistle. <laughs> Was he go to the city to take him down to the boat? Mm -hmm. Oh man, if he be like we be in a uh, a conference or uh, where he gonna speak, he be in the back. We be back there shooting the breeze, you know." Good in me, blah, blah, blah. He's just down to her. He's just down to her. And all of a sudden, dum, da, 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 from him raising my salary. <laughs> See, he's the one that gave us a raise that was livable. Because when I was working, I wasn't making but $4,100 a year. And, huh? I'm not joking. But when he got to be president, he raised it up to 60 some hundred dollars. I'm not joking. A couple of hundred, a couple of thousand dollars. And I'm not joking. Yeah, shoot. You can say what you want to say yeah, about it. Care of you. <laughs> and your family. But that was my main job. Protection of the President of the United States. And I oh my first man was Dwight D. Eisenhower. I was supposed to he was coming in on the on the uh, coming in on the train. 
and I was standing next to the car. So when he come out, I was supposed to open the door for him to get in. Well, something happened, and they had a security, something other. So the Secret Service whisked him away. He was in an armored car instead of that open car to, you know, drive. So I didn't get to see him. But uh, that was my first man. I thought, oh, I'm going to open the door for the president of the United States. And I hadn't been on the police department for a, a week when they sent me down there to open the door for the president. But you did People would come up to me and ask me questions, how to get to such and such a place. I didn't even know where I was. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had just went to Washington. I didn't know, I didn't know where I was. I know I was at the train station. And I, how I got there, they put me in the police car and brought me over there and say, this is President Car. Hold the door. <laughs> I didn't know where I was. <laughs> but you did drive the lead car for the uh, Nixon. Oh, uh, oh that Tricky Dick, my main man. <laughs> when he was inaugurated for the second term, I went to the White House in the police car and escorted his car to the Capitol to be sworn in for the second inauguration. And when we left the Capitol, that lead police car coming down Pennsylvania Avenue in the parade, yours truly. <laughs> <laughs> Driving President Richard Millhouse Nixon. <laughs> well, tell the story about huh? tell the story that Javen wrote about for you him to win the essay about how you got to be able to drive a police car. Tell oh. that story. About nineteen sixty three in the march on Washington. Oh, well well, when I first went in the police department. I was assigned the number 10 precinct. The captain in, in the precinct, number 10 precinct, there never has been and there never will be a colored officer qualified to ride in the police cars. So we only walked. Well, we are, I had a regular beat. I walked. George Ad, I call it Gorgeous Avenue. Because I, I used to strut and I mean, stroll down there and swing my stick, you know. I was the man on the... Man on the beat. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, some, I thought I was somebody, you know, walking down the avenue. I didn't mind walking because I got to meet the people. I knew all the business people. If they was any problem on my beat, I knew about it. You know, a lot of people, even though we were segregated from riding in the car, they... It was a blessing to get to know the people on your beat. Mm -hmm. I mean, you got to know what was going on. You knew more about, you know, people in the car, they don't know what's going on out there. They, 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 all they do is ride around writing reports. Mm -hmm. But walking your beat, you get to know everything's going on. Like the winos who see me in the morning, Officer Reynolds, uh, I'm kind of short today. Uh, I, I ain't get my medicine for the day. <laughs> I said, well, go on and tell Frank, give me what you want, and tell him, put it on my bill for it, you know. <clears throat> so, now the same winos, Frank was the liquor store. So, uh, some guys were casing the liquor store to rob it. Them same winos casing. Officer Reynolds, them guys don't look right. They look like they... So I said, well, Frank, I went in there, I said, Frank, let me sit in the back for a few minutes. <laughs> See, you know, these are the people that come to you to let you know what's going on. And when I stroll down the street in the morning, they say, good morning, Officer Reynolds, if they knew me. If they didn't, they good morning, Officer. They don't even say, you, how many people you see go say good morning, Officer, now? <laughs> no. Okay. no, but I was somebody, you know, and I enjoyed it. I'm not joking, but... uh those days are gone forever. See? Oh, what Maya was talking, my daughter was talking about, since we wasn't qualified to ride in the police car, when they didn't have a white fella to put in the police car, they would park the cars in the alley. It was only two cars, actually. Each precinct went by the number. I was a number 10 precinct. So it was Scout Car 10-1, which is Scout 101, and Scout 102. 
ten two, you know, the two corners. <coughs> so whatever precinct it was, they, the number of the precinct, then the number behind it. Scout ninety one was ninth precinct, you know, what nigga. So Scout one oh two and one oh one and one oh two was parked in the alley when there's no white right. officer put it. So I was walking this beat, my beat, and since nobody was working that night, it was midnight. I had more than my beat. I had the whole precinct on this side walking. I had from, I forget the avenue now, all the way over to the Washington Hospital Center to walk and check doors at midnight. And I walking down Georgia Avenue and the minister saw me. I said, yeah, Officer Reynolds, I, it's kind of chilly out there. And I said, yeah, it's kind of, he said, come on in the church and have a cup of coffee. And I said, well, I can't stay too long, Reverend, because I got all this precinct to walk and check no. He said, why? I said, well, they don't have any white boys working tonight, and the cars are all parked in the alley. He said, what are you talking about? I said, well, you know, we can't ride in the cars. Only white fellas can ride in the car." He said, what are you talking about? I said, well, the cars are parked in the alley. He said, I don't believe you. So he said, I said, I'll show you. So I got in his car. We go up to the precinct to show him the two cars parked. He said, the next day, business day, he went downtown and saw the commissioners. How come to park the police cars in the alley when he don't have any white boys to put in the car? Oh, oh, Reverend, well, you know, well, from that, they got another Studebaker, one of those small Studebaker, mm -hmm. Scout 103, <laughs> <laughs> for a colored to ride in. <laughs> they assigned a colored man to ride in Scout 103. This colored man was named Archer. Archer had blonde hair. <laughs> <laughs> Blue eyes, <laughs> and if he never opened his mouth, he wasn't colored. But when he opened his mouth, you knew Ooh, he, was. he was colored. <laughs> but if he didn't open his mouth, Arthur was a <laughs> white man. That was integrated with a colored man. <laughs> <laughs> but I integrated the, the car where we had, you know, because we had three sections, you know. They had to put somebody brown skin. I, I never rode in it, but I mean, they uh, did get a car for us to ride in. The colored car, 103, Scott 103. But then I had more problems with it because I'm outspoken. I was taught never to bite my tongue and shuffle my feet. That's the way I grew up. Here in Old Keller, Florida, the teachers told me when I talk to a white man, you better look him dead in the eye and talk to him man to man. You don't look down at the ground and talk to him. You look him dead in the eye. That's the way they taught me. Mm -hmm. This was Old Keller because I say this was a progressive town. So I was outspoken. I was, I was what they call arrogant because I didn't go with the... You're supposed to be colored. You're supposed to step back. I wasn't that way. Even when I went to, I I was supposed to, so I was always in, having problems. So the sergeant up there said, Reynolds, we're going to start an a, a old clothes unit. Come on, let's go work with it. So I left number 10 precinct and went into old clothes. We were working robberies, house. Uh, burglaries, we call house breaking up in Washington. They call burglaries a house breaking. And I made a couple of arrests. Guys are stealing people's TVs. You see them running down the street with somebody. <laughs> you know. I made a couple of arrests. And uh, they came out with scooters, the ride scooters. They said, You want a scooter ride? So they sent me, they had six scooters. So they issued me one and a couple of uh, five more fellow scooters. And sent us to school to learn to ride and things. And I learned to ride upstairs, 
down the stairs, you know, go down the park, the steps, and ride down this on the scooter. I could ride that thing. So, Inspector came to me, he says, Reynolds, this is nighttime, he said, you think you could handle a special detail on your scooters? I said, sure, I ain't never said no. Even though I didn't know how to do it, I said, yeah, yes, sir, I know how to do it. He said, well, we want you to handle, a, a, I forget what it was, a parade or something like that. I said, sure. So I took my squad with the scooters. I was in charge of the scooters. And I taught them how to leapfrog from intersection to intersection. So the parade, you stop this car and the next one would be ahead of you to stop it there. And when everything passed, the next one would be, in, you know, leapfrog ahead of the parade. And the, and the inspector said, oh, this is, you're doing a pretty good job. So he said, you in charge of this unit. And he called it the Special Operation Unit. And the Metropolitan Police, but I was the one that started it. Okay. Not only did we have parades, we had a funerals. You know, you see the chef mm -hmm. At The circus came to town, the elephants and whatnot. We handled that. And then we, when they went over there, we had to tra handle the traffic control at the, where the circus would be. The baseball games. We handled the traffic coming into the baseball, you know, special event. Any special event, my unit handled. So I was an officer. So a desk sergeant down in number five precinct got promoted to full sergeant. They sent him up to my unit to be the sergeant in charge. I had to show him what was going on, tell him what was happening, how to op operate. So it wasn't soon after that that I became what you call H I S T O R Y. <laughs> I became history. And right today, we got a magazine, a book they put out, Special Operation Division. But they don't mention me nowhere, though. <clears throat> but I'm the one that started the unit. I, that's the truth. My wife can tell you mm -hmm. that I'm the one who started you, but uh, I don't mind it. Mm -hmm. But now they promoted certain people <laughs> act of Congress. I got fellas promoted, but I didn't get promoted. But like Walter Washington, mm -hmm. the mayor. It was a man, he, he passed not too long ago. I got a brochure where he said he passed. I forget his name. He was a detective from 9th Precinct. He was relieved me. It was three of us to work with the mayor around the clock, 8 to 4, 4 to 12, you know, around the clock. The one, the detective, he stayed sharp. I mean, he was Jim Dandy to the, I mean, he stayed sharp. You know, and uh, efficiency time came for promotion. They gave me an 85. They gave him an 85. And they gave the other fella an 85. So I had to go pick up the mail from his house. And I was disgusted by the 85. Because 85 is above average. But it's not enough to get promoted. The system in the police department is your efficiency counted 60% of the exam. Your written test counted 40%. So if you wrote a, a passing <laughs> mark, which is 70, and had a high efficiency, which is 60%, and your 70 added together, would be more than my 85. <laughs> you understand? Mm -hmm. So... 95 is a high efficiency. They gave me a, a 85, which 85 is above average, you know, but it's not enough to do anything. So the mayor asked me, he said, what's wrong? I said, I'm so sick and tired of this colored folks' efficiency. He said, what? 
colored folks and fish you talking about. I say, well, all uh, all us colored folks want to get an 85, and the white folks get 95, which gets them promoted. Mm -hmm. He said, what, what are you talking about? I said, well, you take Saunders. Saunders is his name. Mm -hmm. I said, you take Saunders. Mm -hmm. Saunders, you, if Jam Danny, you see him lead on the ball, he, he got an 85 just like me. And it, and uh, you know he's he fit, he's top man. Mm -hmm. I, that's what I, I was talking about, Saunders. He said, I don't believe so. When we got to the office, the mayor got on the phone and called Saunders up. Sandra, what kind of fishing did you get? He said, 85. Mm -hmm. Thank you, son. He hung the phone up, picked it up again, and called downtown the headquarters, the chief of police. He said, I want to know why you gave my man Saunders for 85 efficiency. Oh, Mr. M Mr. Mayor, we, I heard him on the phone. I can hear him. Oh, Mr. Mayor, we saw we meant to give him a 95. <laughs> Automatically, he was just promoted right there on the spot. You see that? I didn't get promoted. Saunders got promoted, though. I didn't get it. But you're still alive to tell the story. Oh, so I'm still, yeah. He, Saunders passed. I saw him in the paper with Saunders <laughs> passed. You know, we, I get a news. See, I belong to the uh, Associated Retired Police Office. Mm -hmm. And every so often they send a brochure what's going on. Right. And so uh, in the brochure they tell you who, what officer met their last roll call. You know, the last mean. roll call yeah. is the one yeah. that you see. Uh -huh. so. When you were in D.C., did you ever hear of the Thompson Hotel? It was a white hotel. And it was also a restaurant. But Where they, about? Thompson Hotel. It was downtown. It was a I know it was a hotel where I used to go eat down there right off of, uh, Pennsylvania too. Avenue. It probably was. Yeah, it, it was on on the, on that side of the street and the main avenue and there's a hotel where I used to eat in it. Mm -hmm. And it was a hotel upstairs. It was a hotel. And most people who were traveling would Go to That's where uh -huh, it was for the train people and yeah, yeah. I don't I don't remember the name but uh -huh. I, I I remember going I probably yeah uh -huh. but I used to go in there eat all the time. Uh -huh. Well, they I, had it with the, during the segregation time you couldn't go and you had a certain place for the black people to eat in the Thompson Hotel. Well, and down then, there I always could go in because I was the police. Well, that's right. You had no problem. Yeah, I, I, yeah, you <laughs> could go you know, in there. You know, <laughs> you know, it's it. You know, I I think about when I first. Went to Washington. Mm -hmm. My mother put me on the bus to send me back to Florida. I was in New York. Mm -hmm. And she put me on the bus to go to Florida. The Greyhound. Mm -hmm. From New York to Washington, I sat anywhere on the bus. You could. When I got to Washington, we had to change to get the bus going from Washington South. That's when I had to get on the back seat. That was the Mason-Dixon line. Yeah, Washington, mm -hmm. D.C., nation's capital. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Capital of the United States. I had to go in, they had a colored waiting room mm -hmm. and a white wait in Washington, D.C. That's right. And so yeah, you don't America. tell me. Yeah, but tell them what you did, Lenny. Huh? We, 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 tell them what you did. Oh, oh, that that <laughs> wasn't coming to Florida. Oh, that, that was like, I went to our Rebecca's house in Jacksonville. Oh, yeah. You talking about, oh. I know what my wife's talking about. I was at my Aunt Rebecca's house, my, my grandmother's sister, the one that made the pie for me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she, she gave me a nickel, the, the bus, it was a nickel to go back to the bus station. Mm -hmm. So I could go get the bus to come to Ocala. Mm -hmm. So she said, here, son, here's a nickel to go to, you know, the bus station, get the bus to go. I had the ticket. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I got on the bus and went to the bus station. Look, cubby hole corner at the bus station in Jacksonville with the colored people. It, it was a little angle like that. Wasn't a way but you could only two people could get in there. Stand up in there. And you couldn't sit down. Mm -hmm. That was the waiting room for the That's color. Right. They had them stand. Mm -hmm. So I went I was I didn't go in. I was on the platform waiting for the bus. <laughs> so the bus came in going to Ocala. It's Two buses. One came in an hour early, and the next one was an hour later. The one that come in an hour early came to Island Grove and uh, 
what's that word, Rick? Uh, Joe Me in there? Hawthorne. Uh-huh. Hawthorne and Island Grove. Mm-hmm. The other section came around through Gainesville, Old Keller. So the first section, Island Grove section, the dispatcher said, Can I have five colored servicemen? This is during wartime, mm-hmm. 1943 or 44, World War Two. Can I have five colored servicemen? So three soldiers came up. They said, Any more colored servicemen? It was only three. So he said, You boys stand aside. They wouldn't let the servicemen fighting for the country get on the bus. They filled the bus up with Ooh. white folk, mm-hmm. even the back seat. Mm-hmm. And they said, all oh, you folk had to wait for the next section. Well, the next section went through Gainesville. I wanted to get on that one because that was a straight shot. So, okay. Going to Gainesville and then coming over there, that's where you had to wait, you know. Mm-hmm. Anyway, next section came in. And I came in, can I have five colored servicemen? It's still only three. So they took them, air all the colored folks aside, and they loaded up the bus. Except that one little seat behind the driver, little one seat behind the driver, and I saw it. I walked up to the man, I said, Mister, tell me why no can I ride this bus? <laughs> he said, no color. I said, me no color, I'm Cubano. I must be <laughs> Ocala and get my paper, leave, and go to Tampa and leave country. <laughs> so he looked at me. He walked back over to the, somebody over there. He shh, 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 pointed at me. So he came back over. He said, you get on the bus. So I got on the bus. You know where I sat, don't you? Right behind the driver. <laughs> on the seat of the Florida. It wasn't a gray out of nothing. It was a Florida motor line. <laughs> I rode on the front seat of the Florida motor line. <laughs> Let me tell you. <laughs> we left Jacksonville. As the people behind me got off the bus. And we rode down the road a little further. There's a white, two white men got on the bus. He, he looked at me sitting on the front seat behind the driver. He said, my God, you see what I see? And he sat down behind me where the people had gotten on. And all the white folks on the bus said, yeah, he's the only one got on in Jackson. I heard him talking. Only one got on in Jackson. He said, hey, boy. Hey, boy, you hear me talking to you? I didn't pay no attention. All of a sudden, he hit me on the shoulder. Hey, boy, did you I turned around and looked at him. Hey, boy, did you hear me hollering? What you, the hell you doing sitting on the front seat of the I said, no, I'm in grace in you He said, by God, that boy must be a foreigner. <laughs> 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 but tell us what happened when you got to Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what they, when we got to Old Keller, the bus pulled in, it was behind or the square. The bus station used to be behind the square up there off Broadway. And there's a fella, he's dead now, D.B. Marie. He was red capping the baggage up there. When the bus pulled in by me sitting on the front seat, he hit the door open. He looked up and saw me sitting up. He said, I said, he was I jumped up and walked out there. <laughs> he goes, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, me. <laughs> DB, you got to go blow my coat. <laughs> <That's> big mouth. <laughs> but you know, we travel, we, we build a camper. And we, this was when we were in uh, Washington, D.C. 
Everybody in the neighborhood contributed to this campus. Somebody was putting in new carpet, so they had we put carpet on the floor of the of this uh, truck. And, and tell them about that trip to uh, to to to, to where it was we California. We went Every, all across the whole country. We, that's what I'm saying. We went all the way across the country in this homemade thing. I mean, but it was sharp. We had maybe somebody made curtains. Somebody contributed this. And we had our three children. We were traveling. And it was at the time when they had the riots in war, at Watts and all these other kinds of things. You remember, Lenny? I have a picture. I'm going to show you. Keep okay. Talking. But we started out, I can't remember all these things, but we were in Denver, the brakes went out. No, we went south first. We went from D.C. to Virginia, to left the right. dogs. We left the, uh, yeah, we left the dogs in the... Petersburg, Uncle George. Uncle George. I told, I told we was in Mississippi, on the beach in Gulfport, Mississippi. <laughs> and I told, I told my children, I said, y'all go play on the beach over here. <laughs> you stay on there and play with you while my wife is cooking dinner, you know. And y'all don't go over there with them. I didn't say your wife, but I said, y'all play over here in the beach or water. I look out there, they were over there with the white kids playing, having a good time in the water. I, I, my wife said, look at them, they're over there. I said, let them know. There ain't nobody said nothing. But you didn't tell what that. happened before we got oh, on the oh, beach. Oh, 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 when I drove on the beach. I had this camper, and this man had this little stand, and it had an overhang, you know, where mm -hmm. you open the, you know, get the stand open. And I drove my truck and knocked, uh -oh. knocked him, <laughs> knocked this flap on the man. I said, "Oh Lord, in Mississippi, here we go." <laughs> I said, "Hit this white man stand in Mississippi." I jumped out of my truck with a hammer. I said, "I'll fix him this time." <laughs> He said, that's all right, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> he, I said, well, I, well, I just want to know, uh, can we park on He said, you welcome, you welcome, Mark. But this was back in 1967. 68. 7, 7, I said. 67, because Pop died in 67. Here's a camper that we built. <laughs> oh, Mark, you got to see, I didn't know all this. She got all this stuff. That's the camper that we built. And when I say we built, we built everything but the stove and the refrigerator and the sink. We built the beds, the walls, the mattresses. We even, remember, we even made the mattresses. Uh huh. But we I can say, the other mattresses. people in the community, you can That's us in the geographic center of the United States, uh, United States Kansas. See there? We're in the geographic well, center. What's that? I, yeah, I, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's the camp I made. <laughs> yeah. Oh, here's a picture. That's them in the water. Okay, here's a picture of him when he was in high school. That's why he could look like the Spanish guy. <laughs> <laughs> and this is his grandmother that she said was wrinkled, but she was pretty when she was young. <laughs> There's a picture of me as a baby on the back. How about that? Yeah, that's my that's a picture of me when I was a that? baby. Ain't that something? I, How if, if I didn't have it and didn't put it outside, it would be gone forever, right? <laughs> and here's another picture of him in his police uniform in Washington D.C. You know, I didn't know we had all them pictures. Yeah, we had, we had them. I had more. Your but son took them, and other every all the, the kids took them, took mm -hmm. them all. Mm -hmm. And that, those are the three children. He's on the. Where are the three children? Maria, Lenny, and oh, that's us when we were little. That's when they were little. Yeah, you know, this is me. This baby pictures. You know that? Yeah, yeah. Doris and Aunt Ethel. Yeah, I got one of you and mommy. I'm trying to think of it. Ain't that something? <laughs> Here's my baby picture. Here's, here's a picture when I was nine years old at the World's Fair. Oh, yeah. 1939. <clears throat> I didn't know it. I, oh. I don't have one of your boat. That's me as a baby. You see me as a baby? <laughs> yes. You know, when they had... That's me. This is his that's my aunt. My aunt holding me. Oh, yeah. Mario, did Uncle George... Was, 
You know when they I had the riot. Yeah, you know when they had the riots Did out in Washington, out there in Watts. He me. went down there to help set up the program and everything else. He was a I know you got this teacher at Virginia State College. I'm pass that on over. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Now here's this. This is my father's. Here, this is, to show you our family background. That's my mother's father. <laughs> told and you. that's my father's mother. <laughs> okay. Is that right, like boy. Aunt B off of Andy and Mayberry? <laughs> Does she look like Aunt B? Who's that? Your mother. <laughs> oh yeah. And my father. And her father. <laughs> Father, I told you, Mark. And, and, and do, well, you in know, school, these kids said, "Is your father white?" No. They used to say, "What that white woman doing coming to school for me?" <laughs> Here's another one of his grandmother. Okay. This is him as a little boy. How old were you in this picture, Daddy? With your cousin? How old were you in that picture? Huh. Down there. How old were you? Where your thumb is? I was. Oh, I was about five or six years old. Where did you get that picture from? Okay. <laughs> oh, Here you, this is O'Keller when they see Mary, her. this is a picture of me and Doris when we were young. Yeah, so I've seen these. You ain't never, I never saw that. Oh, right here. I never saw that. No, that's New York okay, City. Okay, but this okay. is O'Keller in 1967. Wow. That's how, okay. that's in front of the house he said that he gave away, but he this, sold. This picture here was what, Maya? Yeah. You were the only one sitting there. Oh, that was when I was working for the agriculture department. You know, I now that's Aunt Minnie and them in, in the house. There's a big tree there now. Yeah, that's little Lenny, all y'all. <coughs> Where was this pig? And this was. I was, I was five or six Kansas. years old in that picture. I didn't. <laughs> oh, were you trying to give it to her? Yeah, I was okay. Oh, I, I didn't. I, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say there they are, Maya, Tanya, and Lenny. This is another view of the camper that we. Drew. This is my father. He killed a snake on the highway, and you can't really see it there, but that's a snake on a stick. Oh, we were okay. driving out west. While we were driving, these are people that we met. I think this is Indiana or Illinois. And they ended up being related to my mother. But we just driving down the road and asked the people, could we pull in their yard? And didn't know we were related. We didn't know they were related. And we'd never been to this state in our lives. <laughs> so how did you never. Related? Later on, because... Kept uh, talking. Yeah. Oh, just kept talking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It happens all the time. I was in a laundromat last week. <clears throat> and this lady came up to me. It was last week. And she said, is that your mother in the car? I said, yeah. She said, she sure looks like my sister. I said, well, uh, you can't be your sister. She said, well, where is she from? And so we started talking. And she said, I, I, I said, well, you know what? You don't look like my mother, but you look like my husband's mother or something. She says, really? I said, well, where are you from? She said, well, I have people in Lachua County. I said, my husband's from Lachua County. She said, well, we're Simmons. I said, he's a Simmons. <laughs> <laughs> and that was in a laundromat, not in in Elachua County. So you can meet people. You can, yeah. That is true. You got the size. Oh, yeah. On our travels, Mari, I don't know if you, yeah, you were with us when we were going across country. <clears throat> Where was it in Chicago? No, that was it in Chicago. No, we didn't go to Chicago. But wait, but that was on our way back. No, okay. we never went to Chicago. You Daddy and I, with Daddy, Daddy in the and I went. Yeah. But in the 1960s, our route was going from down mm -hmm. I-95 from Washington, D.C. through the I-95 to Florida out U.S. 90 because I-10 hadn't been built then. Mm -hmm. And we went through... Um, did you see my picture when I was five years old? Next, so we went through um, Mississippi and Alabama. And in the when corner. we got to Louisiana, now, Mommy, see if you remember this. Louisiana was extremely segregated at the time. And everybody was swimming in Lake Pontchartrain. 
we didn't realize that there were no brown skinned people because in Louisiana you could be black but be whiter than you because mm -hmm. that's just how the color complexions mm -hmm. work out. So we didn't realize it. So my mother said, well, why don't we go swimming? And this is Lake Pontchartrain. When we got into the water, Everybody all the people got, got out the water. Out the water. Yeah, now my mother goes, what happened? Is it sharks? <laughs> train, right? There's no sharks in the lake. We were the sharks. I hear you. To see the difference in Louisiana, where we had just left Gulfport and, and Biloxi, where every, every corner you see the Confederate flag and the, you actually see the hoods from the KKK. They still had these emblazoned on every corner in the 1960s. But now, they didn't treat us like that in Biloxi. We met people from Tennessee. They gave us fruits from the mushmelons from Tennessee. Mm -hmm. They told us we could eat with them, and they were very friendly, they came hospitable. Over to our they traded a a a information addresses. But one state over in Louisiana, we, three little children, got into some water, and the entire white population that was swimming <laughs> got out of the lake. And my mother thought it was because there were sharks and didn't realize we're not in an ocean. This is a lake. <laughs> Okay, that was in Louisiana. Then we go a little further and we go into Texas. My mom goes into the Alamo. You want to tell me what you did in the Alamo, Mommy? <laughs> well, I went into the Alamo and I think I wanted to, to I don't know why, I, I went into my purse to get a pencil to write something. My aunt, his aunt had given me a bottle of my sin perfume. It was a good mm -hmm. smell of perfume. And it fell and dropped. And it just lit up the Alamo. So the guard came over and he says, well, how did he say it? You left your heart in San Francisco, but you left your scent at the Alamo. Okay. <laughs> and then from San Antonio, we went to a little town in Texas called Del Rio. Remember this, Daddy? Del and Rio? Del Rio. And then on the other side of Del Rio is Acuna, Mexico. Yeah, that's the, on, on the border. Yeah, we went into Acuna, Mexico, and that's when he decided... We're not going as tourists. That's that's how we got caught in Calexico, because we looked like tourists, and they were charging us too much money. That was the first <laughs> Texas to uh, Mexico you got on the bus. Um, entrance we went to. So the next time, we went to El Paso, Texas, and walked across with all the other Mexicans. Wow, we, right. weren't, we weren't going to pay any money. <laughs> we walked across like all the other people on the footbridge, and we went into Juarez. Oh, yeah. We went to a bullfight. Oh, and yeah. all and along... Yeah, I paid a nickel to ride the bus, oh, that's right. and they that's wanted me to charge me for her. They said, she I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> that, that's where the nuns tried to take me by the hand oh. and thought I was a little girl that belonged to the other with the other Mexican children. But anyway, to tell you how reality strikes, my mother has got to be prim and proper. It was hot in that bullfight, and she Daddy wasn't gonna sit. pay. She he wasn't gonna pay ten cents for us to sit in the shade. So we had to sit on the sunny side because it cost ten. I cents. didn't know about the sunny and the shade. It cost ten side. cents less. <laughs> so we were on the hot side, and so we were so thirsty, we didn't want any more soda. We wanted water. What did we do? We saw water coming Come off out the, the trough, mountain, out of a pipe, yeah, right before the, the trough, and we drank. We drink water. The trough. Mother, oh, y'all gonna get sick. I'm not gonna drink that. No, she wouldn't drink it. I ain't gonna get sick. I'm going to the restaurant, restaurant and get ice water. And, and got, got sick. sick. <laughs> she got sick. The only one got sick was her in the restaurant. And we she drank the water the coming out the mouth. We drank off the ice off the spout. We didn't get sick. But she went to the restaurant and had ice water. And paid <laughs> and paid for it and got sick. <laughs> and we's drinking the water that the horses drink. <laughs> and people drank out that water too coming out. But there. I'm saying, but that it was a trough for animals underneath yeah. it. Yeah. And she was like, oh, y'all gonna die. Y'all gonna get sick. So that was in El Paso and Juarez, Mexico. So that's, I remember then that. Then we had water. to drive all the way to California now. Uh -huh. So we already got it down pat. We gonna look like natives. Uh -huh. <laughs> Me and daddy and kids. <laughs> Mommy's sick as a dog. I don't think Live. That's why she had to go back into California because she had to go to a pharmacy to get something. Yeah. And she was sick, but we were healthy. We drank I'm the sure. rainwater off the side of the building. We got it naturally. <laughs> That's why you would get back into California. But had she not gone back, maybe we would have never been stopped. Mm -hmm. But she was too sick. Yeah. And we had to be detained because he forgot this other part of the story. It was a man 
who had broken out of jail down in Guadalajara oh. and had taken his daughter from the orphanage and they were trying to get back into America. I matched the description. He matched the description. Ooh. It wasn't just that we were Mexican looking like <clears throat> We matched the description of an escaped convict <laughs> and the daughter that he had taken from the orphanage. Mm -mm. That's why they didn't let us go. Get and down. the fact that we both could speak Spanish and whatever. So that's why we got in trouble. And when but you said we, you're a police officer of Washington, D.C. I that, had to yeah, that, that didn't work. <laughs> that didn't work. No, it didn't work. <laughs> it didn't, I had to bring the, well, his ID back over there to show. <laughs> because if you had seen him, when I tell you his look matched what we needed to look like. Mm -hmm. Did you see that picture? He he can mm -hmm. really look authentic, whatever he wanted to be. Overall, you see this hat? Yeah. You see that? You see that? <laughs> Okay, that? that's how he looked. Who is that? Is you see this picture with the cowboy hat? <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> he could have looked like he was working on one of those farms that goes back and forth. Mm -hmm. And that's how he looked, just like that, when we got <laughs> a, basically arrested because they weren't <laughs> letting him leave. They kept him detained inside. You can call Washington, D.C. Well, everybody knows Washington, D.C. is the capital of the United States. And nobody in California is going to talk about Washington, D.C., right? So then we went from there to California. We went to Disneyland, remember? We were in Anaheim. Anaheim, yeah. Yeah, we went to Disneyland. Rode the Matterhorn. I got sick. Went to, it's a small world. It's a small, small world. Yeah. Then we went to Las Vegas. Oh. And my mother is the so-called gambler in the family. Daddy's not. He put a nickel in it. What'd you get, $40, Daddy? Yeah, I hit the jackpot. He got $40 in nickels. My mother put in a dollar. And she was JD. She didn't get nothing. <laughs> and this is eating. And this is losing my money. You know one thing? I sat up on, 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 on the counter. And had an ice cream and a piece of pie. While well, she was jing, 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 just throwing my she threw away $20. And I hit the jackpot up on the table. On you a know, nickel. On a <laughs> I'll never forget. And this is the first place we ever saw homemade donuts. Remember that, Mommy? Oh. We were in there, and they were making donuts from scratch and putting it into the oil. And we were fascinated because we'd never seen homemade donuts before. From there, we went to Utah. Remember this, Mommy? We went to St. George, Utah, and at this time, people of color were not permitted into the Mormon or the Latter-day Saints oh, facility of worship. In fact, we were not considered really, really humans at that point. We were substandard humans. Mm -hmm. This is in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. But they were very gracious to us. They told us we could not go into their temple, no. but they let us into the basement. We were the first blacks to even go into their basement. They were the first black people they saw, I believe. <laughs> So we went to some place out west and they said they'd never seen black people. They called the town and they, they, they said they'd never seen black people before. And they told us all about Joseph Smith and, and the Latter day Saints. But I not forgot that. And that was in St. George, Utah. Then we went through, where else did we go through, Daddy? Denver! Oh! My father, you know, we built this uh, Bronco. Is that where the no, transmission was, died or something died? It's stuck. The, 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 the brakes stuck. We were at the top of the mountain yeah, in Colorado. And, <laughs> and he had to freewheel it, free wing it with no brake and no transmission. Because you didn't have brakes either with something going yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. And he made it from the top of the mountain to the bottom of the mountain. And we got to the bottom of the mountain. It was a Ford. Remember that? A Ford. Was we, it a factory or something? That was and a Ford it was a dealership. Ford dealership. We went from the top of the mountain not knowing if we were going to safely make it to the bottom of the mountain because it went through all these hairpin turns. Mm -hmm. And this is before they had the fancy interstate, so we were on them two-lane kind yeah, of roads. Going around the mountains. With, with no barriers on the side, yeah, and, right. and his speed is getting progressively faster. Mm -hmm. And with the weight of us on top of the camper, we had to kind of strategically, where we're oh, going to yeah. sit now mm -hmm. as we going down, descending mm -hmm. this mountain. And at the base of the mountain, was a Ford, I remember it was a dealership or something, yeah, and they fixed yeah, the truck. They fixed it. But that was God's blessing because yeah, we sure could have been at the bottom, it could have been a Chevy dealership, right? Yeah. But anyway, yeah. it was that. We got that fixed. He's had his hands around us all our lives. Yes, mm -hmm. we have been a very blessed people. And then from there, we went into Colorado, Kansas, Missouri. The next exciting thing was Ohio. Remember this, Mommy? We went across a bridge that went oh, from Ohio yeah. into West Virginia. Right. And my mother goes, man, 
This is the rickiest bridge I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> How many people cross this? One I week. One week after we made it back to Washington, D.C., that bridge collapsed. I don't know, I don't know maybe you're too young, and all the cars fell All down. the people, people that were on the bridge you know what died. They, you know what they, speaking of that, I was in Chicago at my uncle's house in Chicago, and we had to take the train to go downtown, the L, you know. Yeah, the L. And, uh, and we were going, down to, going around the curb downtown, the train's like, I said, listen to this thing. It's feeling like it's going to fall. Fall off this track. Is it squeaking like that? He said, my uncle said, oh, no, don't worry about it. It's been squeaking like that for 100 years. It ain't going to fall. I got on the thing, came back to the, the, the Washington. When I got back, you know what happened? It fell. That train fell <laughs> off the track. <laughs> That but same train fell off. Same but to track. tell you how a life always comes around in a circle, that happened in 1967. Mm -hmm. Now flash up to 1987. I'm working as a health inspector in St. Augustine, Florida. And the woman that worked under me was from Ohio. And I said, oh, I've been to Ohio when I was a little girl. In fact, we crossed a rickety bridge between Ohio and West Virginia. And it <laughs> collapsed the week after we were on it. She says, my father was on that bridge. She said, but what happened was, um, there's a piece of the bridge that's still on land before it goes over the yeah, river. Yeah. His car stalled on the part of the bridge where it was still over land. And so he never got on the bridge. He said what happened was all the people that lived in Ohio that went back and forth to West Virginia to work in the mines mm -hmm. or whatever, mm -hmm. they had just had a shift change. So there were people coming from work and people going to work. And mm -hmm. the weight of all those cars and people, mm -hmm. the bridge could not sustain it. Mm -hmm. And he said all the men in his ship died but him because his car stalled oh. on this part of the bridge before it got onto the part over the river. Mm -hmm. I said, isn't that amazing? I said, my mom said, I can't believe it. This thing looks too rickety. And then, let's go back. I told you I flew mm -hmm. over a, a, a volcano in 1991. One week after I got back to Florida, the helicopter, I don't know if it was the same one that I was on, but the helicopter that was operated by the tour company that I flew over, it was sucked by the heat convection mm -hmm. into the oh, open lava. Oh, gracious. Because I, I don't know if I can find it, but... I was only 10 or 15 feet over the open cauldron of the volcano, and you could see the heat waves. Mm. You know how heat waves over oh, the road? Yeah, yeah, well, you can yeah. imagine heat waves from a volcano. It's like this. Mm -hmm. And it was rocking the, the helicopter like that. I said, is this safe? Oh, yeah, we do it all the time. That's dangerous. <laughs> it wasn't safe. It wasn't safe, but like I said, God has had his hands on our family. Like I said, my dad has been lost at sea. He didn't want to tell you that. But when my brother was 10 years old, he and my dad and another man went out in a boat. He told that. Not that part. Okay. Not Kenny. I'm oh. talking about Lenny oh, when Lenny. he was 10. Oh, okay. And Uncle Kenny was still alive. Oh. And they had to summon people from New Jersey all the way down to Maryland looking for daddy. Remember? Yeah, we spent the night on the boat. In the middle of the <laughs> ocean, right? <laughs> in the middle of the ocean. Atlantic Ocean. My brother was 10. So that tells you how long ago that was. But then two or three years ago, so you know that's like a 40, 50 year span of time. My father's still going out there and getting <laughs> caught in sea. <laughs> I don't let him go out anymore. You can't have somebody to go with you. I don't believe you can't go. You can't go. The only thing we haven't been is in airplanes that had problems, right? Oh, yes, it did. We've been coming back from... Oh, how could I forget? Oh, hey. <laughs> you know how I want to forget it? Because my son is going to Hawaii. Oh, and wow. I didn't want him to go through LAX. And he's going through LAX. <laughs> my mother and I... I was in a car accident. A congressman <laughs> ran into the back of me, or his aide ran into the back of me in his Porsche when I was in law school in 1990. And so when my settlement came back, I told my mom, I said, you never been to Hawaii? I never been to Hawaii. We may never get another chance. We got enough money. We're going to Hawaii. <laughs> so I took my mother and myself and my nephew, Kenny, and we went to Hawaii. We went to Mexico. We went to California. We had us a good time. All we right. went to three different islands in Hawaii. And on our way coming back, we stayed about four days in California with my husband's good friend in California. We left their house. We had a rental car. I said, okay, mommy, let me drop you off at the airport, and I'll go take the rental car back. Like I'd done in every other place. 
but I didn't realize how big LAX is. Oh, yes. LAX is another city unto itself. Mm -hmm. So if the rental car place is here, six miles down the road at the other end is where the plane is you have to catch. So I dropped them off. They had the suitcase, the luggage, and everything. Even my pocketbook. I didn't even keep my pocketbook, which was stupid. And so I said, let me go park it. On the way coming back, I'm looking at the time. I'm like, oh, I only got two minutes. I don't think they're going to hold the plane for me. I got two minutes. So as I'm walking up to the counter, it's already said flight departed. I'm like, oh, man. I have no money, no pocketbook, no driver's license, no ticket, no clothes, no nothing. I'm homeless in L.A. And no mother, no nothing. So I'm all dejected. I said, no, what am I going to do? This is before cell phones. This is before mm -hmm. the internet. I looked to my left. Ma, what did you do? Did y'all get on the plane and get off the plane or something? <laughs> remember, but I remember that. I think that she realized that I wasn't going to make it. So she got off of the plane and was waiting for it. So at least we were all together. And she mm -hmm. had my pocketbook with right, my yeah, list. Because yeah. otherwise, we really would have been up the creek. Anyway, so we missed the plane. Now we've got to figure out what we're going to do now because our friends think we're on our way back to Florida and we're homeless in L.A. because we have no, we gave up our hotel room. Yes, right. We, we gave up our rental car. We have nothing. So I said, okay, so let's get on the bus. We're going to figure out how to tread, navigate through L.A. on the city bus. We had to go all the way to Hawthorne, California. So we ride on the bus. Y'all, we homeless. Y'all, hey, what do homeless people? We just on the bus having a good time. And I know what we're going to do. We made it to Hawthorne, California. My husband's friend had gone to an L.A. Lakers game at the Forum, and his wife was working at the mall. I said, well, well, Mommy, we can walk around the mall till the mall closes, and then hopefully walk over to the house when they get off, and maybe they'll let us in their house or something. <laughs> yes, they let us in the house. We spent the night. They weren't looking for us, so we slept on the floor. That morning, there was an earthquake. That's oh, right, that's right, there was. There was an earthquake in L.A. <laughs> mm, they and uh, I said, well, I said, let's go. Did they even, did we ride the bus? They don't even I mean, drive us, did I, don't remember. I think we rode the bus back to them because we didn't have any luggage. All we had was a pocketbook. Mm -hmm. So we rode up. We knew how to get the bus back to the airport. We got back. The plane we got on, as it was coming into Jacksonville, yeah. Florida, it got about Tallahassee, and they were supposed to let the landing gear down. And the, and the um, pilot gets on the um, announcer and he says, I'm sorry to inform you, I cannot tell whether or not the landing gear has descended. Mm. And if it has descended, I cannot be sure that it's locked into place. So what we're going to do is we're going to detour this plane to Gainesville and have a little uh, airplane come up underneath this jet. Jet travels at 500 miles an hour, plane about 150 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. He said, now this is a dangerous maneuver, but this is the only way that we can try to secure whether or not the landing gear is descended. So we detoured to Gainesville. Jet's going 500, the plane goes underneath, and he says, okay, yes, the landing gear is down, but the instrumentation would not secure whether or not it was locked in the plate. Okay, we got about 10 minutes before we get to Jacksonville. They're going to phone the runways because we don't know if we're going to have a crash landing or not. We had to prepare, prepare for crash, crash landing. landing. <laughs> and the pilot wanted everybody to know this was no joke. He really meant it. He pulled back the curtains, walked up and said, look, this is the first time I've ever done it. My name is Captain So-and-so. Please follow the instructions of your flight attendants. This is for real. This is serious. We don't know. There's this one man that thinks he knows everything. He was a passenger. He said, ha, this is not going to happen. There was a lady, she stood about six feet tall, a student. Her name was Edith. I'll never forget it. She said, Mr., this is no joke. Took the man and pushed his head. <laughs> he said, this is for real. <laughs> they were scared. <laughs> when she did that, everybody played for the Everybody was down. All, all people that couldn't bend were trying to bend. <laughs> and my little nephew was crying, are we going to die? Are we going to die? <laughs> As we entered the Jacksonville airport, somehow even with our heads down, we could see there were fire trucks on both sides of the runway where we were. They had cleared everything and they foamed the run because they did not know we were going to crash. When he landed safely, the pilot ran back and said, thank God we've made it safely. You could now exit the plane. Everybody ran straight to the bathroom. Because it was like, thank you, God, we made it. So that was our experience coming through That's LAX from Hawaii. from Hawaii. Now, my baby has to go to Hawaii by himself. Mommy's not going to. Not, he's not going to have a mommy. I had my mommy, and I was 30-something years old. He's 17. So I, that's why I didn't want to recall Hawaii mommy. Anything. That's right. We made it. You know, we, yeah, we made it. it. 
But we were together and got lost at LAX <laughs> and messed up, right? So anyway, um, that was our that was our trip through from Hawaii. But it was interesting. Okay. When we went to Hawaii, we learned some things. The people that we see on TV that we think are Hawaiian are not necessarily Hawaiians. Hawaiians look more like my mother and my father. That's right. Those are more like people from Polynesia, from like Tahiti. That the Hawaiians look like them. Because when we were there, remember the man told us there's only about 300 or 500 full blooded Hawaiian people left because they've intermingled with all of the other people from Japan and China and other countries. He said, and he was a big guy. He was about six foot four or five. They're big people. Wow. Yeah, the guys are real big. So we learned what Hawaiians look like and about their outfit. What was that man's name, Mario? Heavy D. Heavy. Yeah. Was that his name? No, but we called him. <laughs> we called him. He was huge. <laughs> <laughs> that book got damn. You, you know, you're talking about people intermingling. It was an article I read in a magazine years ago. Years ago about Virginia. They said there was no such thing as a white, full-blooded white person in the state of Virginia. Mm -hmm. They said, it was, you know, people don't realize that when slavery first started, they brought the slaves from Africa to Virginia. Mm -hmm. Not only that, they had what you call indentured servants okay. from Europe white that they brought to Virginia. And the indentured service was the same as slaves. They mingled. You take my father-in-law. He is a product of the indentured service mingling with the slaves. But in all essence of the word, he was a white man. You saw a picture of my He father. was a white man. He was white. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but Pop Davis, Pop Davis, his brother would get mad if you called him a white man. And, and er, en Ennis was whiter than Pop. <laughs> I got a picture of him. I have a picture of him. And, and, and Uncle George, he was a redneck. <laughs> Uncle George was so white that you could see the blood coming out of him. <laughs> he was a redneck. I, 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 this I, is Uncle Ennis, the one he's talking about. Now, he looks like a confederate, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he looks like got a picture of Ennis. I got a picture of Ennis. I'm going to show Dave Uncle George, too. Here's he Uncle George. He's called him black. This is his older brother, Uncle you George. What? Yeah. Uncle what? George. You see him? And I'm going to show you my mother's father if you didn't already take a picture of that. So, those are three brothers. Let me see this. You got Uncle... Uh, yeah, and him. next to your mother. No, that's Uncle George. He's the redneck. Uh-huh. And I'm going to show him Uncle, um, your granddaddy. I mean, granddaddy. And then on the other side was Uncle Ennis. <laughs> There's me with that double barrel shotgun I was talking about that burned up. That burned up. Oh, yeah. Huh? I just had one with your daddy, Mom. I just, what? That old long-time double-barrel shotgun. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad these pictures are here. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, yeah, okay, now this is my mother's father. So that's three brothers. And do they all not look Caucasian? Yeah. I mean, there's nothing African. I wouldn't have guessed. He could be your father or grandfather, right? <laughs> Looks a little like my grandfather, actually. <laughs> <laughs> See, there's nothing African or Afrocentric. There was no aspect of them that looked in any way, especially him. He looks like he should be called Pappy with a with a car cob in his, and he looks he looks like a Confederate. Do that. Uncle Ennis. Oh, this is Uncle George here. Mm -hmm. but those you know, three Uncle brothers. George and I, be, he used to like to take me with him wherever we go. Uh -huh. And I'd get in the restaurants, Uncle George, and everybody <laughs> looking around. <laughs> look at me and Uncle George. <laughs> Uncle George. Oh, no, we have a picture that I'm going to show you the contrast in the family complexion. Uh, he's, he's, he's holding Jo Mia when she was oh, a baby. Yeah, yeah, because I remember that with the dog. The, the, mm -hmm. the complexion contrasts. That's Uncle that. George Blow and your mother. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, they mixed. That was you and that's Uncle George and, and, and that, that cocker spaniel only loved my father. If 
and he was sleeping in his chair, look, touching me. I said, now look, you better behave yourself. <laughs> we have to feed you. <laughs> but I mean, animals love my father. There was a That's a Rosewood. Bluebird. Yeah, it was a blue that bird. Was rose that there. was his Inside. property. In fact, that was in front of your house. One of them showed the house. Oh, okay. anyway, this blue bird that was would come fly out. into the house for my father. Hmm. Hey, he'd sit there. Let me see if I can find it. Can you so imagine that? And I said, look, it's time for you to go, buddy. Yeah. I don't want you messing in the house. <laughs> no. I open the door and he'd fly out. My father would go out. Yeah, he would go out. Heaven. My father would go outside. And he'd come out there. He had a no, I don't know. The animals dislike it. That's interesting. Papers are trying. Yeah, yeah. This must have been your first birthday party, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Happy Who? birthday. Uh -huh. Who's? Robert E. Davis and me. See so many things of That's this. My mother had put in the paper. When he died, a year he, after he wait, died. You know, this one, his happy birthday, honey, when he even shaved it. Oh, yeah, that's when he died. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was trying to see if I could find another that's one. That's your daddy. Yeah. And your little dog. His little dog. Yeah, little dog. <laughs> his little dog. That dog wouldn't let you get near him. He, <laughs> he, he, he'd be sitting in the chair, and you, put, you go near him, that dog get you, ready to get you. Get that little dog, stupid dog. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's like my father. Mm -hmm. I, can't, I thought I had another one of the house. I guess I, there was one with Uncle George standing in front of the house. I guess that one. This is the best dog I had. This Frisky. No, Frisky, yeah. That's Frisky. Yeah. But you we, know, that I was got my dog. Frisky? was mine. But we were in Rosewood. You know, when you come into that road yeah. to go back, mm -hmm. the yeah, sand right. would be so sugary. That I'd have to call, I'd park the car, mm -hmm. and I'd whistle, and the dogs would come to meet me. Mm -hmm. so, I, so I wouldn't have to go back by myself, especially yeah. if it was yeah. dark at night. Yeah, anytime would. I'd whistle for them, they would come. That's uh, good. Yeah, that's that, good. They were good. That was the best thing. Because they were running free, they wouldn't change. <laughs> <laughs> But Frisky, Frisky was an all around dog. Mm -hmm. And I, I got him as a puppy. Mm -hmm. And I used to take him in the park and up the rabbits and, and say, get him, Frisky. Frisky would sit there and look at the rabbit. Mm -hmm. I say, well, get him, Frisky. You know, he's a hound dog and wouldn't chase a rabbit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let me tell you, my next door neighbor say, let's go hunting down Virginia. So I say, we'll take Frisky with us. I was walking through the woods and Frisky was sniffing around in the woods. All of a sudden I heard something say, Frisky, Frisky had up the biggest deer you wanted to find. And he was dead on that deer, and he was hollering. He ran and brought the deer back up the road. I was standing in the road, and here come the deer up the road, and Frisky dead on his and I'm standing, and the deer coming dead at me. I said, bam, I just shot up in there. So when I did that, the deer jumped over the head, and Frisky came up with her, and then when the deer jumped up, he kept, and he took off running after him. I said, I got a dead dog instead of a rabbit dog. But you know one thing? That dog, okay. Let me tell you about Frisky. Frisky would put his feet up on a tree and look up. You know what it meant? A squirrel was up there. He didn't treat a squirrel. Oh. And let me tell you, my wife, mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you a secret. Mm -hmm. My wife and I, was, she said, let me go hunting house. with you. Mm -hmm. So I gave her my little 410 shotgun. Uh -huh. And we were going along, and Frisky was walking along the road, and all of a sudden Frisky froze, and his tail shot back. He was, I said, oh, look at Frisky. There was a big pile of brush there. I see he pointing birds. Mm -hmm. I see I got an all around dog. <laughs> <laughs> so I say, Mary, get ready. <laughs> get ready some birds, cause Frisky pointing them. I say, you ready? She say, yeah, I'm ready. I say, you sure you ready? I say, yeah. I say, get him, Frisky. Frisky leaped on the pile and the bird, blah, 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 blah. she through the door. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> it fell on the ground. <laughs> 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 
Not only that, when we got up, <laughs> I didn't know this. There were some hogs on the other side of the fence. Mm -hmm. I climbed over the fence, and, and I think they thought they, they thought they were going. I was going to feed them, and here they come rushing me. I said, ah! <laughs> From the birds to From the, the birds, what you do? Get out of the fence. The hog was chasing them, <laughs> and, and she was running the hog behind. No, I didn't know they were going to. There's another picture. You hear all the weeds. Yeah, they have all that noise. Yeah, they like, uh, frightened me to death. <laughs> and you went on down. They quail, you know, quail. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, we're going to have to get you to play the piano for us. And we're going to have we to get you. We got to go. Home. I know you've been here all day long. <laughs> you sure you don't want no soda or nothing else? Yeah. <laughs> Feed you something. No, I have some water. And I always bring my water when I go out. So. But, I mean, we got other things. I know, but I'm fine. I'm, I don't know Would about Would you that. gentlemen like something? I mean, I think we're doing okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. But this is just wonderful to have this time. You better get over there and play before he go to sleep. You know, this is nap time. <laughs> oh, is it? Oh. Don't you see him? And he's sitting there rocking, too. <laughs> <laughs> and, and if I put the vibrator on the chair, he's gone. He's gone. <laughs> <laughs> you hear it? It's, it's ready. Hey. You can understand. Good day for it. But. You know that? Hmm. I love, I can play that thing. Daddy, can play. you can do you can, it. You can I like that one that you got at your house. That's a beautiful piano. That's a beautiful piece of wood. That that's old, my that's piano. Old, that's yes. an old boy. Well, that's Let me tell you. He had a nice, what do you call it, Mario? A nice piano. Oh, your, the piano you have now. Not that, that one, the one we had before that. Oh, that, the that one that was Michelle, the one that was that one too. Or the one from the house here that mm -hmm. yeah. burned up. That yeah. was from the hotel? No. No, that came from. The uh, O'Kella. That was a family. Uh, yeah, family. That, that was the one that, that was came the from one that Michelle O'Kella. learned to play on. Yeah. But it's the one that came from. Oh, you mean the one that was in Aunt Minnie's house? Yeah, yeah, the one that Michelle learned to play on. That burned up. I tell you. <laughs> then he had a nice keyboard up there, and then he decided to go and get the. Oh yeah, well I went, I went and saw this piano. You know when I hit that the keys on that piano that I got, uh -huh. I said, uh uh, you had that keyboard. I know you, you I, got yeah, the real deal. I like that piano. You got the real deal. Nice he did an all nice brand new keyboard for this old. <laughs> I guess we can. Uh, I tried to clear a space, so if you want. I don't know. I can't play tomorrow. Either. Yes, you can. Well, this. I think it's got some battery life. I can see if you do it. Except there's a plug over there. Okay.
played years ago. Start him off, Maya. Start me off, Maya. Oh, yes, my Jesus. 